There are a whole lot of things happening in the world that are scary and alarming. Joe Biden says that uh, food shortages are coming. He says that if Vladimir Putin used chemical weapons, we'll respond. Others have said that if they use nukes, the fallout could spread to Europe and then NATO be forced to respond. And two members of the Russia, Russia's nuclear chain of command have gone radio silent and people are paranoid. But we're not leading with that story. As much as those stories are important, we will talk about them. The one thing I think is particularly important is that the Daily Wire's Jeremy's Razors yes. in just three days have surpassed Harry's Razors in followers. The reason I think this is, <laughs> this is significant is that what happens here in the United States culturally will impact us politically, and then we'll have very serious ramifications. Joe Biden wouldn't, uh, would not be president if the right had a stronger culture or more dominance in cultural spaces to influence people, which ultimately leads to voting and practices. And for a lot of the problems that we see from our political class, it has a lot to do with the fact that the left dominates cultural institutions in the media and they control it. So seeing a story about Harry's canceling or denouncing the Daily Wire and the, uh, the Daily Wire rebutting and growing bigger than their own Twitter account in three days, five million views on their commercial in only a few days, I think it's significant. And as you know, my opinion on The Daily Wire is that what they're doing is absolutely fantastic in building culture. So joining us to talk about that is co-CEO of The Daily Wire, Jeremy Boring. Co-CEO and God King. Yeah, of course, King. yeah. Sorry. I, Come on. Yes. You know, <laughs> Blasphemy. I mean, and, it seems like such a small ask. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and also um, uh, member of the, the hot duo Smokey Mike and The God King. Smokey Mike and The God King. Smokey Mike. Good stuff. Yeah. You know, the thing about Smokey Mike and The God King I mean, obviously, our early work is our best work. <laughs> the stuff we were putting out in the 60s, I think, is it's just Top underappreciated. It's a yes. shame that the culture is forgotten. Yeah, Jeremy's 87. Yeah, mm -hmm. he looks great, right? Yeah. Hey, well, that's Jeremy's razors at work. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the, you know, the, the most amazing thing about, uh, and I haven't said this anywhere, obviously, this is my first uh, time on the show and, and my first time to share this information publicly. We've sold 25,000 razor subscriptions in our first three days as Whoa. a company, which is an amazing thing, obviously. Uh, and it makes the joke much funnier. The thing you have to know about me <laughs> is that uh, I like to tell very, very expensive jokes. Smokey Mike and the God King being one of them. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and I like to tell jokes where people don't know if you're kidding or not. That's yes. always very important to me. And with with this, I was so incensed by, not, not by Harry's Razors pulling their ads, which that's just the market at work. If an advertiser wants to pull their ads out of our shows because they... You know, they're going through an economic hard time. If they want to pull ads from our show because the ads aren't working, if they just don't like the cut of our jib, all of that is fair game. If they attack us on their way out publicly, well, that's just bad behavior. That's rude behavior. We were good partners. We told our audience, leverage our personal credibility to tell our audience about Harry's Razors, our conservative audience, by the way. Harry's knew what they were getting. They knew what they were buying. Mm -hmm. And on their way out, they decided to virtue signal uh, and respond to a tweet that had two followers and say uh, that we had inexcusable views and, and a case of values misalignment. And I thought, well, I, I still have the same audience I had yesterday. Why don't I tell that audience that Harry's doesn't want their business? I, I don't see why we should. You. I don't see why we should Let's, put up with that. We'll save some of it too because I just want to yeah. run through the intros, but we'll, we'll loop back. And Wait, there's intros? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Intro. I thought the whole thing was like an extended commercial. Yes. Yeah. For oh, Jeremy, you, you stole my introduction time <laughs> right from we, me. We, we, we could, you know, sh should we should we pause and discuss what percentage I'm going to begin? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll come back. <laughs> there yeah. Go. By the way, old Smokey Mike and the God King. I, you know, I don't know what Smokey Mike's talents are, but I know the God King never released a hit without him. So there you go. Yeah. Um, I'm Seamus Coughlin of Freedom <laughs> Tunes. We just released a video this morning as well as a video two days ago. Tim voiced Dr. Fauci in yes. both of them. They were both a blast to make. I really recommend you guys go check those out. And if you want to donate at Patreon, you'll get to see the behind the scenes of Tim and I recording it, doing some improv and the whole production coming together. So but, it was but, a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, uh, it's also Seamus' birthday. Mm -hmm. It's also yes. my birthday. birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Happy yeah. birthday. 27. Nice. Seven. Big year. Yeah. Which is why of your yeah. saturnal return. Which it's is why they forced me to come back. I was like, I little, just... Little old to be a virgin? <laughs> no, that's <laughs> not. rude. Wow. Well, listen, Actually, not, you're not too old to be a virgin if you're not married. There you go. That's I've heard point. that the age, from age 27 yeah. to 30 is the saturnal return, and what you do for those years basically dictates what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. Hmm. Not, not a one-to-one -one ratio, but it worked that way for me. I will say that the prohibition against premarital sex in the Bible was meant to encourage people to get married. Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, not to just masturbate think... late into old. <laughs> no, age. you. Sh I mean, you just not... shouldn't masturbate <laughs> at all. It's it's supposed to serious sin. Yeah. So let's go. Let's talk about that on the after show. Because yeah, let's let's yeah. the after show. Yeah. Uh, oh, I hate Ian Crossland here. And you know, I don't use a straight edge. I haven't in a long time anyway. But if you guys looking at uh, going into electric razors, ooh, I like that. I like where your uh, all right, where your where your razors are at. 
I, anyway, I'm just going to pass this over to Lydia. Let's <laughs> get that in. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate that. I'm very excited to be here tonight. Love Jeremy Boring. He's one of my favorite non-commentators of the Daily Wire. <laughs> Somebody in the comments was saying that he is smart and polished, so I'm really looking forward to tonight's show. I'm one of her favorite non-commentators. Yeah, that's right. Because you, you keep it to I don't know, a minute. I've already heard some specific. comments from this guy. <laughs> like, it's just very precise. I was going to say you're say. like me in that you save up your words yeah, and keep it down. Yeah, it's great. Before we get started, head over to <laughs> TimCast.com, become a member, help support our work directly, and you will get access to exclusive segments of this show. TimCast Arrow Podcast will be up around 11 or so p.m. We do that Monday through Thursday at 8 p.m., so, of course, we usually have the spicier show, the not family friendly, all the swearing and drinking and fighting. Yeah, all that uh, happens in the members only show. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding about the fighting. We had a guy here, you know, and he's, he's good times. smacked the mic. And, yep. You know, those things happen on the members only program because we, we like to, uh, I guess, have fun, whatever. Uh, but support our work directly at TimCast.com. You can also smash the like button right now, subscribe to this channel, share this show with your friends if you really do want to help us out. And we got to read this first story. In just three days, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the Jeremy's Razor's Twitter account surpasses Harry's in followers. Oh. So many of you heard a little bit already about this. You know a little bit about it. For those that aren't familiar, Harry's Razor's is woke. They denounced the Daily Wire's audience. The Daily Wire launched their uh, their own version, essentially, Jeremy's Razor's, which now has a, a what, what do you say, Jeremy, 25,000 subscriptions. Yeah, 25,000 subscriptions in 72 hours. Nice. I'll just say real quick, and we can get into the beginning, the story of all this, um, the building of culture, yeah. the building of infrastructure, which means the ability for someone to buy a razor. You know, pe people watch Netflix because where else can you go? Well, now the Daily Wire's got something. People buy Harry's razors because, or, or Gillette because they need razors. And these companies are investing your money in things that uh, you don't value or in people that hate you. So what the Daily Wire is doing is profoundly important. Many people are doing it, but you guys seem to be leading the charge. So Jeremy, do you want to tell us just a bit about how this started, yep. your position, and where you're at. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you said, I think, is is a big part of it. Like, conservatives have been, you know, sort of in retreat for most of my life, certainly for the last uh, 15 or 20 years. And as a result of that, we've, we've sort of taken a very pessimistic view. Conservatives spend a lot of time lamenting the loss of the past, lamenting uh, the loss of the economy, lamenting the loss of their place in the culture. Uh, and Daily Wire has a different attitude. We're we're not lamenting anything. We're we're happy to be alive right now. Like I'm glad that we live at a time where uh, black people people can drink from the same water fountains that I do. I'm glad whatever water fountain is. I mean, I guess they can drink from the same water bottles right. that I can. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, you know we have penicillin. Like th there's a lot of that's great about the modern age. Um, what I want to do is take the great values that were established and worked in the past, learn from the past, and build on a foundation. Uh, I want to be proactive. I want to I want to be optimistic about the future. I, I don't want to lament the past. I want to build the future. And so when someone like Harry's virtue signals publicly and, and attacks my business, um, I want to build my own business. Like conservatives deserve razors too. And and I think that it's an important, you know, the, the left, these world corporations, they think that they can sort of rip the culture in half and not pay any economic consequence for it. So I want to rip the economy in half. I want to say, no, if you can't just alienate 50% of the audience uh, of the people in the country and still expect them to buy your goods and services, they should buy the, their own goods and services. And that sounds like I'm saying that I think we should be further balkanized, that I think that we should be further divided. I do in the short term, but I don't in the long term. I desire a country where we're all uh, citizens together, where we can where we can embrace disagreement, where we can embrace political processes. I just think things are so out of alignment right now that to return to a place like that, you have to create economic incentive. Yeah. And the only way to create economic incentive, it's not with temporary boycotts. Uh, it's not with complain culture uh, online. It's not with doom scrolling. It's mm. with actively building things that requ that now require companies like Harry's to compete for our business. Exactly. Competition. Competition. So so uh, did Harry's have any wind of what you guys were planning on doing? Or, or <laughs> do, you want, do you want to just give us the quick version of the story for anyone who doesn't yeah, know? Absolutely. So one of uh, the people who works for me, a, a peon, hmm. Named Michael Knowles. <laughs> oh, the worst. Uh, I, yeah. I know none of you have ever heard of him. Nope. Who yeah. who has? Yeah. Uh, Michael was on a podcast with another of our hosts, Candace Owens, but it was not a Daily Wire podcast. It was a Prager University podcast, and it wasn't uh, a year ago. It was several years ago. Wow. And they had a conversation about how gender dysphoria uh, has historically been categorized as a mental illness. Mm -hmm. I it believe was, it is it currently in the DSM five, uh, and it was, it was that was the conversation. It was a respectable conversation, a respectful conversation. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, one year ago in March, one year ago right now, 
and a Twitter account that had two followers. A high schooler. A high schooler with two followers. Mm -hmm. uh, pointed out to Harry's uh, that this conversation had taken place, and Harry's immediately reacted uh, on their Twitter account and said, you know, this is inexcusable. This is values mis misalignment. We're pulling all of our ads, uh, and we're gonna and we're gonna make sure there's no further values misalignment in how we and how we conduct our sponsorships. Well, when you do that, you're signaling to all of my other advertisers that the only excusable thing to do would be to also pull your business from the Daily Wire. That makes it an attack on my business, right? It's not just you taking your spend, which you can do anytime you want. It's you attacking. Uh, your company, a, a company that had been your partner previously. It's also attacking my audience. You're saying my entire audience, an audience you paid us to go help you sell razors to, has inexcusable values. Uh, and I'm just not going to put up with that anymore. I think one of the beauties of this medium that we all have, this this digital presence that we all have, is that there are so many fewer gatekeepers. I don't have to make you know the radio syndication network happy. Uh, they The radio syndication network wants you to just take cancellations laying down because they have other shows. They don't want to get into a war with the advertisers. But, you know, with your show, with our shows, we're still going to have the same number of people watching tomorrow, no, whether Harry's Razors advertises with us or not. So why wouldn't I embrace that freedom? Why wouldn't I use that, that, that same amount of time that I used to spend telling people to buy Harry's, which, by the way, Harry's is a great razor. I was proud to tell people to buy Harry's. I was proud that we supported the work, that, you know, supported their product. Uh, but they don't want my audience to buy their razors, clearly. So I'm going to spend that same amount of time telling my audience that Harry's doesn't want their business, and I do. And you're going to make more money. Do you ever think yeah. that adding like a, an extension to the handle of the razor would be good so you could shave your back? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We're, we're, that sounds we're, dangerous. Yeah, that it could be. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, maybe put a warning label on it. Do you have back it. shaving yeah, well, problems? That, that would do it. No, but just thinking it for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Just in case. A back shaver? We're, we all... We all have back shaver problem. Back shave <laughs> at some point. Like we may not have them today, but the day is coming. That's right. Yeah. So, so where are you at? You're, uh, what, what, did, yep. can, can you mention how many subscriptions? Twenty five thousand subscriptions we've sold uh, in seventy two hours, which makes us the dog who caught the car. I mean, for us, hmm. the commercial was everything. And this is what I told my team all year: we were sourcing razors, we were mixing up shaving creams, and seeing if we liked them. And what was important to me, though, was. Whether we ever sell a razor or not, the commercial has to be a statement about the Daily Wire. It has to be a statement about our brand. It has to say that we're proactive, that we're having a good time, that we're looking to the future, that we're not going to take cancellations laying down. Um, it has to remind our audience what we are and what we stand for. If we happen to sell any razors, it'll just make the joke that much funnier. Well, now I'm the dog who caught the car. I have mm -hmm. an actual business. Now I have to stand up over the next two weeks to make sure that we can keep up with the demand that's out there for these races. Is it that a Five? year a year ago, I just want to get the timeline accurate. Yep. A year ago, they pulled the ads. A year ago, they pulled the ads. So you've been in, in the process this last year, building yep. everything. And how long did it take to produce the commercial? It was a three-day shoot and and uh, five or six weeks of post-production to get the commercial out. Nice. Awesome. Five million views since the 22nd, so not even two full mm -hmm. days. It's 4.9 million views. Yeah. It's amazing. Oh, was that a real flamethrower? It's a real flamethrower. It's not the smartest idea I ever had to fire a flamethrower in my office, but it's definitely the most Jeremy. badass. And, that's, you know, that's that's Elon's, and it works. Right? Jeremy, yeah. Selling Jeremy. The Boring Company? Oh. Yeah. Is oh, it yeah. made by the Boring Company? It is the Boring Company yes. flamethrower. Oh, okay. ah, yeah. yes. I'm Jeremy I'm Boring too. fired the ask. Boring Flamethrower <laughs> at <laughs> Gillette and Harry's. It was not boring. Oh, that's Amazing. awesome. Do you believe in synergy, like in like divine inner confluence and things? I definitely believe that if Elon Musk will retweet my razor company, I will sell even more bajillions of razor blades. Yeah. I, I'll actually, <laughs> th this will be the most kiss-assy thing that I say on the show. Elon Musk is the greatest living American. He's Hopefully. the most important person in the country because he has an affirmative vision for the future of the country. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know his politics. I'm sure I disagree with him on 50% of everything, but that's a guy who has a vision for what we can be tomorrow. He's not... He's not one of these like boomer lefties who's still fighting the cultural revolution of the 1960s or the economic revolution of the 19 teens and 20s in Europe, you know, trying to socialize the country. And he's not a boomer conservative who's just talking about how great things used to be back when we were 
uh, still young and rock and roll. He's a guy who's going, no, no, we can actually build some. We can build our best days are ahead of us. Let's go build. Them. We were talking about leadership last night and Savannah Hernandez was saying we need leaders. And I thought, yeah, you don't. But you what you don't want is a guy to step up and be like, I'm your leader now. You want yeah. someone like Elon or like you that's like building something that people can you just casually building it. And people look at you like a leader because of what you've created and what you're creating. I agree with you that I'm a lot like Elon. Yeah, you're a lot course, like yes. Elon. Your beard's very nice, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned <laughs> oh, that earlier. Yeah. And I think for, for, for the average person, you know, they would, they just look at Elon and you as very, very wealthy, successful people who have a vision for something. Elon, though, is, you know, one of the, is he the richest guy? Like, richest guy on the planet, I think? I think. It's so. a good or is it I think Bezos and, is ahead of him, no? I Maybe. think I it doesn't, even if Bezos is ahead today, you just have to remember that SpaceX hasn't gone public. Mm. Oh, wow. All yeah. of Elon's wealth really is Tesla, right? I mean, when we right. think of his, his vast wealth is Tesla, what happens when he takes SpaceX public? I mean, the the amount of money that that guy is actually worth, I think, is... Dude, he called it Starlink. I think he's actually going to be linking star systems with that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe one day he'll build the Dyson Sphere, but I think we're a long way, a long ways away from that. Well, time time can condense, you know, when you have a, a lot of... Time and space are the same thing, so if you can move fast enough, you can... Mm -hmm. And if a lot of people are working together, it kind of condenses time, too. And if you have drones building things all at once in space, you can compile, like, large spacecraft really quickly. Self-replicating machines we send off to other planets, perhaps, mm -hmm. to just carry on the American vision. Perfect. That's it. it. That's but the no, end of existence. I, I think you make an interesting point. It's true that unfortunately a lot of what conservative has been, ha, conservatives have been doing for the past 10 or 20 years has more or less just been complaining about the left and it's really yep. important for us to forward our own vision. That's a huge part of what I try to do. <laughs> agree or disagree with me. That's part of why I'm frequently talking about my faith and my own particular vision for conservatism because mm -hmm. even though I enjoy making fun of the left and pulling them apart, we actually have to give people something that they can believe in instead of just saying that's bad, don't do it. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that. So yeah. uh, you guys are making movies. We are. Daily yeah. Wire. Uh, you're making shows too. What's how, how does it come to be that the Daily Wire, you guys, you guys are, are news aggregators and commentators for the most part. Now you're in this cultural space. Yeah. How does that happen? It was always part of the vision, right? We, we, the company was founded in L.A. Obviously, Ben's lived in L.A. every minute that he wasn't at Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent 20 plus years in L.A. before moving the company to Nashville at the end of 2020. Uh, Andrew Claven, screenwriter, novelist, was with the company from the very beginning. There's always been this really kind of Hollywood foundation to what we do. You know, I made a bunch of movies in, in a previous life that they all failed, but I made them. I'm proud of them. Um, and so when when Ben and I made the decision that we wanted to get into business together, one of the things that, that I told him, and, and it was an idea that uh, another conservative commentator, Bill Whittle, uh, helped me formulate, was that if we built a media company that was large enough, we would actually have a spotlight and we could shine that spotlight on other kinds of projects that we might want to make. What happened, and so for me, that was always movies. Like I had a production company with, with some young actors uh, when I was in my early and mid-20s. I had uh, a production company later in life called Declaration Entertainment that was sort of just just probably ahead of its time and underfunded to actually be what it maybe could have been, uh, but was sort of intended to be like a crowd crowdfunding uh, film company before there were crowdfunding companies. The so that was always part of what I wanted, but I thought what we would do is we would build up a big enough audience that if I went and made something on the side, I could promote it. To me, that's how I saw it. But what happened to, in 2020, you know, everybody went home because of COVID. Our office is on Ventura Boulevard in LA. It's the second time we've had to board up because Black Lives Rally is, is uh, Black Lives Matter is rallying on the street and we're afraid they'll burn down our building. And I'm, so I'm on the the third floor of this office building with my business partner. It's completely empty because no one's been to work in weeks and weeks and weeks. And I said, Hollywood's over. Like, what can they make now? Hmm. They've, they've decided that the police are bad. Literally 40% of everything that Hollywood makes is about a cop. They, wow. they can't do anything if this is the position they're going to take. And that's when we realized not only had we built that spotlight that Ben and I had always wanted to build, but we had built something else too. We had actually built the distribution mechanism because we had built this streaming video on demand platform for our podcast, for the video versions of our podcasts. And it just occurred to us in that moment, you know, the technology is agnostic as to what the content is. We've essentially built Netflix. We just haven't put movies on it yet. So if we, if we bring in the one other thing you need for, for a successful entertainment company is just production. If we bring in production, we actually have marketing and distribution. Why don't we give that a try? And as, 
because you know i know there isn't a god but if, if you ever think about how there um, is. if you ever think about how the world has so much purpose and how everything's so complex and beautiful it's almost like a godlike being probably from outer space built it all not god because that would be a silly thing that's insane to, like we're probably <laughs> a crazy person but like just a godlike being uh, you know if you really think about it uh, that when the godlike being sometimes there's this like fortuitousness or providence that happens in the world and as we're having this thought dallas sonia who's been a guest on this show mm called me and said, hey, I made this great movie called Run, Hide, Fight, and Hollywood won't buy it mm -hmm. because I've basically been blacklisted. And we just saw that as an opportunity to test the theory. If we put a great production through our marketing and through our distribution mechanism, what will happen? It was an unbelievable success for us. The movie paid for itself in something like seven days. Wow. And we realized we realized that we had an actual now opportunity and and i always think opportunities are always responsibilities so now i say we have a responsibility to go chase this let me tell you about impact <laughs> i would i would like uh for you sir to please read the headline ah. on the screen i <laughs> <laughs> i watched a ben shapiro movie by accident that's right yeah this is some leftist who watched uh i believe they watched shut in mm -hmm. and uh, liked it so much they tweeted how much they liked it, saying, if you're looking for something to watch, Shut In is pretty fun, and Vincent Gallo gets his ass kicked if you're into that sort of thing. That's a tweet I wrote a couple weeks ago, late on Saturday night. It no longer exists. <laughs> the reason it doesn't exist is because almost immediately after I posted it, I got a DM from a friend. Uh, you know that movie was produced by the ultra-right-wing Daily Wire with only ultra-right-wing producers, talent, and so forth for the market. Um, what? No, no. Delete, delete. What? Yep. <laughs> They're trying to make real movies now. Sneak that ish in under the cover of actual production values. For F's sake, this always happens to me. I will be watching an ultra-evangelical movie and not realize it's ultra-evangelical. I'll be listening to Christian radio and not realize it's a Christian radio. If Jesus is around, I need him to announce himself or I'll just think he's from Brooklyn. Hmm, the, funny, the funny thing about this is that I hope it's satire and it may be, <laughs> but um, I'm assuming it's not. I don't know. It's the, great, it's the greatest article. I mean, at the end, they say, maybe if you keep doing this, maybe one day I'll watch one of your movies on purpose. Oh, well, but, but, oh. but, but here's so we, well, we, also, we, I we, loved, real quick. We, we did talk about this the other day. But I just want to point out, uh, you know, with you here, get your thoughts. This is someone who's saying they actually really enjoy evangelical movies or the Daily Wire's content. But it says a lot that they're unwilling to watch things they enjoy because of, yeah. of cult-like behavior. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the point I made before we got on the show is thinking about your commercial with Jeremy's Razors, it's, a, it's an objectively funny commercial. Thank okay, you. obviously, you know, humor is subjective to a lot of people, but it's it's very much in line with a lot of the, you know, the real American heroes bits that were happening out through the two, 2000s, 2010s, you know, real men of whatever and that stuff. And it's an over the top, it's silly, use a flamethrower to torch, and there's a lot of jokes. It's funny. The the Native American Elizabeth Warren you have standing behind you. A lot of jokes in there. <laughs> the people who claim it's not funny or they don't like it, they're only saying that because they're part of a cult they have to adhere to. That's right. Privately, they admit they like your movies but they must say they don't like it for the sake of their political tribe. Well, also, when these people say something isn't funny, am I supposed to sit there and go, well, you know, the things you think are hilarious tend to be really valuable and enjoyable to watch. So, of course, I trust your opinion on this. To I quote, mean, none of their comedy is good. But part of why I think this, and I could be wrong, part of why I think that this is probably satire is because, unfortunately, most of the stuff that conservatives and evangelicals make tends not to be funny or entertaining. And they're hmm. saying that they keep seeing things made by evangelicals that they don't know are evangelical, which is, is kind of part of I, why I'm thinking it's satirical, but I could I, be wrong. I'd like to quote um, Justin Roiland or his character, mm -hmm. Rick Sanchez. Mm. Your booze mean nothing. I've seen what makes yes. you cheer. Yeah. yeah Best right. quote. So there you go. I mean, first of all, the funny thing is they cheered for you guys, your guys' movie and they're only booing it now when they realized who made it. I'm like, no, nah, you can't take it back. You yeah. cheered for it. We know you like it. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, as an insecure artist, uh, <laughs> you know, anytime anybody says they like anything that I did, I don't hear anything they say right. after that. Like it's, <laughs> no backseat. It's all a buzz, yeah. So what's the plan? What's what's next? TV shows? Yeah. TV shows, movies. We, you know, as with the Razor Company, we just see a lot of opportunity in in the destruction that the left is, is mm -hmm. bringing to the culture right now. I mean, I think it's tragic. Listen, if I could snap my fingers and put the country back together and have everything be like it was back when I grew up, I'd probably do it. If I could be dictator, that's what I'd, I'd just say, hey, it should be 1990s all over again. I kind of like the, the 1990s. The 90s were epic, dude. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. there was no, the yeah, races man. all got yeah. along and Power everybody was Rangers, doing pretty well. Fast food wasn't K was going that up. bad. That's know. right. Transformers, Beast Wars, come on. Dude, 97, well, but, 93. But you can't do that. 
and it would be disingenuous for us to say in all of this uh, destruction, there's not an opportunity for creativity. No, absolutely. There is, and we should take it. What? The, oh, no. I, well, I, I totally agree, and this is part of why I got into the sphere. Firstly, yep. I just always wanted to make entertaining content. Uh, I, I lean right. People on the show who watch me regularly know this. And what ended up happening is I just got to a place after I launched my channel and was doing these political cartoons for a little while where I just realized I didn't really need to try to put a message into anything. I just needed to make something that I thought was funny mm. and my values would naturally come out in it. So often what happens when conservatives try to make content or evangelicals, Christians, even Catholics try to make content is they will really hit you over the head with what the central message is supposed to be instead of just making something that's enjoyable to watch and yeah. it turns out really cheesy now what's ended up happening over the past couple of years is the left has adopted that strategy and so much of what they produce is message first substance later and so you're absolutely correct that they're tearing their whole empire down because i remember as a kid we used to watch films and television shows from the 1950s or 60s with our dad and he would make comments about how they could never make that today now we're saying that about things that were made 10 years ago yeah that's right um how do you guys get around the the esg stuff that's been coming <clears throat> you're familiar with the what, what, what is it in, in environmental uh, social governance yeah yeah, yeah. so for, real, real quick for yeah. those aren't familiar this is basically social credit scores for businesses and they expect you to be woke, to have these, you know, diversity statements. Otherwise, they could negatively impact your ability to get loans and things like that. So uh, the Daily Wire is making all this content. You guys are, are, are going after culture, but isn't there a risk there if these other institutions come at you? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of risk everywhere. One of the problems I think that conservatives face right now in, in the economy more broadly is there are so many potential vectors of attack. Uh, and you could put a lot of money into chasing any one of them, and then that could just not be where the attack comes. So you wasted all of your resources trying to plan for a disaster that never came. And now the disaster can come from a whole other angle. An example of this, conservatives want to build their own social media platforms right now. You know, you hear every time I talk to any sort of like conservative billionaire, the first thing they say is, when are we going to get a Facebook? And I say, uh, it's, Facebook is 20 years old, bud. Uh, <laughs> you will probably get one 10 years from now. It's been half a biblical generation since it was created. So I think that you're, you're getting close. Soon you will have one. Uh, but that's the whole problem with conservatism uh, from an investment class point of view. Most conser high net worth conservatives made their money in energy or they made their money in real estate. They made their money in agriculture, very conservative ways of making money. Uh, and the result of that is if a kid with a backpack walks into their family office and says, hey, I designed an app that lets you rank how hot girls on campus are. I think if you gave me a little capital, I could turn it into the dominant communication platform uh, ever conceived in all of human history, they would call security and throw that guy out. Yep. Now, 20 years later, they go, why don't we have a seat at that table? But if the if a kid with a backpack walked in now and pitched them blockchain or pitched them meta, they would have the same reaction that they had 20 years. So it's like, I bet we have a conservative Facebook in 10 years, and I bet that we have a conservative metaverse in 45 years from now, right? Like that's that's the problem. And so, but as with all problems, it creates certain opportunity. We found an early investor in our company who was able to get us off the ground. We we took money from them that helped us for the first 14 months. In month 14, the Daily Wire was cash flow positive. We've paid for all of our growth since then out of cash flow. We did $120 million of revenue in the last 12 months. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, sometimes I get angry when people are like, oh, billionaires pay for everything you do. No, no, no. Like many companies, we we were privileged to get some startup capital. So, you, but you, we funded all of this out of our success. So you you're just saying uh, Daily Wire pulls in ten million a month. Yeah, and wow. because and because of that, the ESG stuff right now doesn't apply to us, right? Mm -hmm. We don't because we funded our own growth. It's it's sort of like your situation here. Uh, you've built something. Now you didn't even have the amount of startup capital that we had, but you've built something that you own, and because you own it, you can't be canceled from it. You can't be thrown out of it now. Our goal at The Daily Wire is to become an institution. Our goal at The Daily Wire is to challenge the left uh, on an institutional level because we think that's the only place that true victory can take place. Maybe at some point we'll have to go to the public markets. Um, but what we won't do is get caught up in the CSG stuff. Like, it, it may come to, at a certain point, we have to decide, do we subject ourselves to forces that change what we are, or do we not grow? And what The risk I see is... Uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. When I watched that commercial you put out, when I saw the building you were in yeah. and the TV and the structure, I'm like, that reminds me of Vice. You know, when I, yeah. when, when I worked there, when they were edgy, when they were offensive, when they were shocking, the way they designed their buildings. And I was like, man, is the Daily Wire like Vice now? Like how they used to be? 
How did Vice go from being sex, drugs, and rock and roll into wokeness, outright, you know, establishment? And there comes a time. Hundreds of millions in institutional capital. Did they go public? But it's, uh, they, well, they want to. I think they're trying to go through a SPAC. They've wanted to for a while. My understanding is what I was told by uh, former higher ups mm -hmm. who were at the company is that they had been attacked so many times by uh, they had harassment complaints, yep. sexual harassment, that the press was bad and they had paid people out. And there was a risk of certain stories going public. Hmm. So their investors said, just declare yourselves like a feminist company, like make feminist content, adopt this, and you'll shield yourself from these claims. Hmm. And so the idea, this is what I was told that, um, and this is someone who was like, I worked with there, I worked at Vice. They said, when the investors came in and said, be a feminist company and you will be safer from these attacks, they said, okay. Because yep. the executives didn't care so my understanding was, or is, they were just like, hey, whatever gets people off our back, you guys, no problem. We just want to make cash and run a business. None of these executives care. Disney doesn't care about the grooming law down in Florida, mm -hmm. right? Of course they don't. They, what they care about is their 23-year-old woke employees um, making it impossible for them to conduct their business. What they care about is the fact that the left is so, is so skilled at weaponizing, and they want to avoid those attacks to their business. And so it's a, it's a, the thing about virtue is that it's actually a really cheap currency. You just say something. Hollywood's always peddled in this, you know, even in the glory days of the 90s, you know, and we were all walking around sucking on a big gulp or whatever. Uh, you know, <laughs> everybody in Hollywood wanted to save the freaking whales because, of course, they want to save the whales because when you're on, like, your third marriage and yep. four out of your five kids are in rehab and— uh, you you Got to save something, I guess. You, you want Everyone needs to see themselves as good on some level. Right. And if you're good for— Christians do this too, by the way. It, it, everyone, an easy out is to find an abstract way to be good. You know, it says in one of the epistles written by the Apostle John that uh, it's easier to love your neighbor whom you know than to love God. And Christian, every time you talk to a Christian, they go, well, that's not really true. I mean, my neighbor's kind of a jerk. My brother's kind of a jerk. But of course I love God. And I said, well, you don't. I mean— God himself in the epistle mm. says that you don't. Mm. You say that you do because you've abstracted a God that you can love more than your brother whom you know. You've created a God to love who approves of you and who doesn't have anything that you disapprove of. Your neighbor, your brother who you know, has all kinds of crap that you don't approve of. And so you see, like, it's very easy to give money to African missionary work or African charities or to save the whales or to save the environment. Oh, These are ways of abstracting your way out of having to deal with the messy reality of the world. If you really care about people, you interact with those actual people and try to make their make improvements into their lives, right? Yeah, I would actually agree with that. And I would go as far as to say when somebody says that they love God, but they hate the people around them, don't do anything to improve their circumstances, either material yeah. or spiritually, that person really worships themselves because their vision of God is just, it, it, as you said, something abstract that mm -hmm. caters to all of their particular desires. One thing that I think our society has really lost is people are not focused as much on what is near to them. They want to solve problems on the other side of the world. That's a huge part of progressive politics. In fact, you could argue it's the only part of progressive politics is to defer responsibility elsewhere. Historically, people understood you were supposed to love those closest to you, care for your family first and foremost, and then you started to worry about the people around you. Now it's the exact opposite. I can we, treat my family horribly, but as long as I am yeah. theoretically good to someone on the other side of the world, I'm a good person, even there, though my entire social life is a complete failure. The uh, greatest psychologist of our time has a statement. Jordan Peterson, you have to clean your room, man. But but that's that's, that's exactly dirty. the meme. The meme it's is true. you can't change the world if you can't even get your own life in order. Yeah. yeah. But I, I want to point something else out too. Um, well, also when it, I'm when I'm looking at this article from Defector, yep. and they're holding up a sign saying "F you, Ben Ishpiro," like just cussing at him. I think to myself, I don't I don't recall seeing conservatives holding up signs saying F you, Jenk Uger, or I, I, to be fair, obviously sometimes they do, but yeah. it's kind of a common occurrence among the left to hate and to hate without trying to understand. Yeah. So I, I was, mm. I'm thinking about Daryl Davis. He's been working with uh, Bill Ottman over at Minds. They want to de-radicalize extremists, not de-platform them. It's one of the things they're working on. And Daryl Davis, you know, he's the guy who went to Klan meetings, a black man, and just talked to these people to try and understand them, ends up de-radicalizing them. It's fascinating because... When I see how the, the modern left, the activist left, not like regular run-of-the-mill, you know, Democrat voters, they're, you know, mostly just regular people aren't paying attention maybe. Yep. But these activists just, they hate 
they hate so much. It's the weirdest thing that Glenn Beck can tell Dave Rubin, I disagree with you and I think what you're doing is wrong, but I love you. Yep. And what do they say? They say, F you, Ben Ishpiro. I'm like, man, Glenn Beck tells the people he disagrees with that he loves them. They tell you they hate you. I don't understand why anybody would want to be a part of that. Yeah. Well, this is the problem with dogma and ideology and politics is that they allow you not to have to actually engage with the world as it is. You're only required to engage with the world sort of as you perceive it juxtaposed against a code of your, essentially of your own making. And people can say, well, no, my dogma is, is 2000 years old or my dogma is uh, well, as, you know, come straight from Athens or whatever it is. But the truth is, uh, if, if you're a person who can't engage in reality, then your dogma is an abstract. Your dogma is just a reflection of things that you want. And it's a way of, to your point, mitigating responsibility for the actual people around you. You know, you, I, I've thought a little bit about our, our, I actually was about to say something that I had committed not to say on the air, so I'm not going to say it. Nice work. Thank you. Uh, it's it's rare that I make a good decision, but I just made a good decision. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, but it, it's so Im it's so important. You know, God. If you're going to believe in God or the godlike alien who actually made the heavens and the earth, mm -hmm. uh, oh, you sure. you well, well, there's a whole conversation <laughs> there. Yeah. Yeah, is... You you actually have to believe. Like God has to be the God of reality. I, I took a friend <laughs> ten years ago. I, I I'm married uh, to a woman. I never talk. I, I won't say her name or talk about her too much. But I will tell you this funny story that uh, I, I took a friend's future in-laws out to a movie 10 years ago. And the first thing that, that his future mother-in-law said to me after the movie was, I said, oh, did you enjoy the movie? And she goes, well, I don't really like movies. I said, oh, great. Uh, and she said, uh, uh, you know, you, you and your wife are married? I said, yeah, we've been married a short amount of time. She said, well, you know, in God's eyes, she's still married to her first husband. Mm. And, and I said, oh, well, God must be an idiot. Wrong. <laughs> because that's not true. But, but that's is. not that is not reality. God has to be the God of reality, not the God of an abstract fantasy. But I think I so I would argue as a Christian that that's an abstract fantasy that you can divorce and remarry if it was a legitimate marriage in the first place. Because one of the definitions of marriage is that it's a lifelong commitment and to, until death do you part. But what would you argue as a Seamus? And as is, a Seamus? Well, I mean, that's my belief. Do you, yeah, do, you like, God, do you actually believe it or do you just believe that the Christians believe it? No, I believe it. I mean, I believe, I, I think most Christians don't believe it, unfortunately. I, I, I think a lot of Christians have abandoned that. It's not a popular teaching anymore. I suppose you could define the word marriage meaning to mix. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to mix your soul with something, if there is a God, if there's an energy field. There's no can, unmixing that soul. That's a good point. Well, well no, yeah, there's no, there's no un, unsaluting a, a solution, but I think you can reverse a mixture. If you mix mm -hmm. red and blue paint together, you ain't getting them back out. Mm. Right? Yeah, I mean that, that's, I don't know, that's it's a meaningless analogy. I and no so I, I, I think you're yeah. onto it, though. Yeah. Well, let's let's no, let's. Uh, I, I'll I'll push back on that just a little bit. Sure, God's the God of reality. Divorce Absolutely. exists in the Bible. Uh, that's not a recommendation of divorce, which mm -hmm. is a horrible, terrible thing. Um, but the the idea that God lives in a sort of abstract where things are as they should be, how far back do you, how far back do you take that? Essentially, if that's the case, then God still lives in Eden, before. The fall happened. God still lives in a place where people haven't been living in sin, where people haven't been making mistakes, where none of the sort of causal, you know, n none of the eventualities that came from that causality of sin have ever occurred. And God is abstracted out of being the God of actual people in an actual place in an actual time. Uh, the God of the the God of the Bible, in my estimation, is a God uh, who actually took on sin and took on the consequences of sin on Himself in Christ. As a result of that, He becomes God of a of a reality that's. Uh, he, he becomes God of the people who have existed in reality, not just the people who could have existed in the abstract. So I, I just think that any time that we used... See, this is a great example. Mm -hmm. That's a, a place where we use sort of a dogma or an ideology to deny a reality that's right in front of us. I think you see it a lot with what's happening in, in Ukraine right now, by the way, where uh, regardless of your opinion about NATO expansion, regardless of your opinion about uh, the merits of Zelensky, regardless of your opinion about a lot of things, like Vladimir Putin actually did invade Ukraine, and Ukraine did not want to be invaded and you see a lot of people left and right but particularly on the right who are almost in denial about that situation because it doesn't line up with their political point of view they have a political point of view uh that um that ukraine shouldn't have done certain things or 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 that uh putin was more friendly to the west than he actually turned out to be or that friend or that putin was a better representative even you even hear people on the right right now saying that putin was a better representative of christianity because he built a cathedral you know at, at one point in time or something and then actual reality takes place in front of them. They have a very hard time pivoting to accept it mm -hmm. because it's because it's out of line 
with their expectations based on how they thought the world should be. Yeah, yeah Hitler I, was I time wanna... man of the year. Um, yeah, Hitler was yes. time man. And, and they the did year. appease him for a long time. So I, I, I hear some of what you're saying, and I, I agree with some of what you're saying, but I would say where we definitely disagree is that I would argue that God having moral prescriptions for us that we ourselves do not live up to does not mean that he's over abstracted or, or doesn't govern our reality because it's actually Christ in scripture who who says what uh, God has has brought together let no man put asunder and, and anyone who leaves their husband commits adultery etc the challenge he also says if you have lust in your heart you are an adulterer yeah you're not on the adultery. you're not Agreed. on the path to adultery you're not Agreed. kind of like an adulterer if you really think about it wonder, yeah you are one I wonder yeah, about that. If, you're, if you're in a marriage absolutely. and you're thinking about having sex with another woman yeah. does that make you cheating on your wife yes that's adultery of the heart that's crazy how do you control your thought like you got to learn to control your thoughts yeah absolutely custody of the thoughts I mean nothing happens in the world that didn't first happen in the human heart well yeah, let's, I, let's I, I would actually disagree I think the entire purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is to get us out of these abstractions. It's to con it's to bring the full weight of condemnation. To it's so that no one can claim not to be an adulterer, not so that we can also try to figure out how to not commit adultery in our heads. I, so I would absolutely agree that people should not be sitting here, and it is certainly not my, not my claim to say that I am not a sinner or that I have not committed adultery of the heart, etc. It's simply to say that I don't believe recognizing that negates the moral precepts that, that Christ put forward. These are very profound moral, ethical, and religious questions mm -hmm. that are very difficult to uh, to get into, especially, you know, we could talk a bit more about, I suppose, in the members only segment if you guys want to get into the, the core of it, because I love having these conversations. Mm -hmm. But when you got into Ukraine, I was like, let's 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 segue, yeah. you know, and then it's like it gets pulled back into the philosophical. They need razors in Ukraine. Let's talk they about do, it. They do. They do. So here, <laughs> basically, more this, than ever. this is me navigating a very hard segue back <laughs> yeah, to this topic, right. which we had pulled up, which is. Biden warning of real food shortages, uh, food shortage risk over Russia's invasion into Ukraine. We've been hearing murmurs about this, but it's very obvious. Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. They produce mm -hmm. wheat. Russia exports fertilizer. We're no longer able to buy that fertilizer for the most part. The prices are skyrocketing, which means the spring planting season will be limited. And that also means the fall harvest will be severely stunted. So you can expect to see food shortages here and in Europe. And Biden is warning about it. Yep. I think well, there's a couple things to point out. One is that Biden has basically said, we're going to, what did he say? We're going to disseminate food shortages around the world. Yeah. What a ridiculous thing to what? say. Sounds like a and, Biden thing to say. Yeah. But, you know, people will be like, what he really meant was we're going to disseminate food around the world. Well, you don't know what he meant. He said, he said he's going to make food shortages worse. The other thing is, this is the direct result of a lack of culture coming from the right. Because politics is downstream from culture, as Andrew Breitbart said. Yep. And when you get a 2020 in which every channel, every movie, every media outlet is all screaming orange man bad. It lights people up to get out there. And I, I always bring up the story, man. People I know who have no business in politics. I certainly think they have a right to be. But these are people who couldn't tell you what the Supreme Court was, how many justices it has, or even name a single member of Congress going out and voting. Why? Because their media and their culture tells them what to do. Now we're seeing the ramifications of this. Joe Biden as president is not responsible for every crisis we're dealing with, but he's certainly a bad leader who said he's going to be disseminating food shortages. <laughs> now we get to experience those food shortages. So it was a promise. Yeah. Because to yeah, stop was. literal Hitler, you would elect anyone. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it looks like the actual quote is, uh, we both talked about how we could increase and disseminate more rapidly food shortages. <laughs> That's a great quote. <laughs> That's our Biden. Uh... You ever... <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> just makes it just makes me contemplate time, you know. <laughs> the passage of time, yes, please. The passage of time. The passage of time. Yeah. Well, just, what is time? Uh, imagine oh, guessing gonna... this situation five years ago. Like, yeah, we're gonna have these food mm. shortages, and the president's gonna go. <laughs> oh, he's gonna d distribute the food shortages. Or, <laughs> um, imagine being Donald Trump, speaking at a rally and saying, "If you vote for Joe Biden, you're gonna have your gas prices are gonna go way up. The economy is gonna be bad, and you get freaking fact checked and shut down on." Facebook for saying it probably at the time. Yeah, you guys missing probably. context. They would have said. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I remember uh, this one fact checker. Someone quote tweeted me because I talked about Bill Clinton and Epstein's plane, and they fact checked it as false. When you click the fact fact check, it's it explained in great detail how I was correct. Yeah, they it's it's the most insane thing. They, they, they did it to Josh Hawley. Uh, Politifact did it, where they were like. Josh Hawley says that, you know, Judge Jackson was lenient to, let's just say, child abusers, very extreme child abusers. And they were like, mostly false. And then you scroll down. It's like, well, it's true. She was lenient to these people. Mm. It isn't a, a, a uh, it, it isn't out of the ordinary for Everyone's judges to be lenient. It. And it's like, yep. did he say it wasn't? He just mm -hmm. gave a fact. So, 
Well, this is the reality of where you're at when your cultural institutions are dominated by a cult and by people who are, are intent on just controlling the system, even if, even if it means burning it to the ground. Yeah, the institutions in this country were always the real bulwark against uh, state incursion, uh, st state intrusion into our lives, right? You had the states actually created the federal government so that they're like the ultimate pre-federal institution. You had the church, which was one of the most important institutions in the country. You had other institutions, though, corporate America, I think the probably the, the it's unpleasant to say, but like probably the institution that mattered the most in many ways uh, as a bulwark against state power. You had uh, the family, the ultimate institution. And mm. what the left has done over the since the 60s is they've infiltrated every one of those institutions. Since the state automatically essentially desires what the left desires, a, a state, the natural state of a state is to grow its power over the individual, um, which is a which is a left wing goal. Since that is the truth, when when the left takes over all the institutions that allowed uh, the the people to essentially it solves the collective action problem of the people in defending their rights against the state. Once once the institutions are on the left, the institutions immediately essentially become an arm of the state. And you see that with all these fact checkers. You know, I, I actually, I have a soft spot for fa for Facebook. I mean, Daily Wire has been the number one publisher in the world on Facebook 15 months in a row. Wow. Uh, yeah. we, we do really well on Facebook. Uh, I think Mark Zuckerberg, if you were to talk to him personally, wouldn't see himself as a guy who has taken voices away from so many people. He would see himself as the guy who's given a voice to a billion people. Mm -hmm. uh, nevertheless, the institution that he's created, because, you know, 30,000 people at Facebook all walk in lockstep, uh, with the left, they've become an arm of the state. And so instead of corporate America now, it's all the things we've been talking about all night, HR and all these things, instead of corporate America solving the collective issue, uh, the collective um, uh, action problem of the individual, they actually become a part of the state's power to set, to shut down the individual. And that's why you get these incredibly Orwellian expressions like fact checking. Right. How can you have a fact check that says you are mostly false, that something is mostly false, which is completely true? And what the answer is that missing context or mostly false, the piece that they say was missing or uh, that would have th th that created the falsehood is just their point of view, not more information, not more fact, their point of view, missing context. If I say Joe Biden isn't a good president, you know, they will say uh, fact check, <laughs> mostly false, missing context. And you'll right. read the article and they'll say, well, hyperinflation, <laughs> uh, war overseas, the end of American hegemony, gas prices through the roof, food shortages, food shortages yeah. are being disseminated around the globe. Uh, but other presidents have been bad. And and well, no, I, I they would say Joe Biden this. actually promised to disseminate those food shortages. So he's keeping his campaign promises. <laughs> he's yeah, a good president. Right. Let me ask you, we've had we've had a few people on the show. We recently had mm -hmm. uh, um, a more middle of the road guy on the show. And uh, sometimes we hear this from the from the moderates that, uh, you know, oh, the both sides things. I think both yep. sides have their problems or whatever. My response to this is like, look, man, I, I, I personally have never been the staunch conservative guy. I've actually, when I was younger, I went to Catholic school up until I was in sixth grade. Then I went like anarcho punk rock, hang out with these hardcore like lefties. Yep. And then eventually kind of just found a middle of the road place. But when you have, I love going through the list of stories, Covington kids, Russia gate, Ukraine gate, Jesse Smollett, uh, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, lie, 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 lie over and over again. At a certain point, why aren't these people being like, I was lied to, I shouldn't listen anymore? You know, you've, you've got these fact checkers who come out yep. and they fact check stories that later turn out, like the Hunter Biden laptop. All the fact checkers It didn't later out, turn out to be true. It was always, it was always true. true. Was right. true. <laughs> they and always so, knew that it was true. So how, how like, what's your view on this? Yep. Look, I talk about, I call it a cult all the time. We call it this, we call them the city ur urban liberal types. Sorry, uh, yep. people living in cities, but you're the cult. And uh, I don't, I, what are your thoughts on this? Why well, are, are they faking it? Are they lying? Are they just stupid? I agree that it's a cult uh, to some degree. I mean, the, it, it looks like a cult if it looks like a cult, right? And smells like a cult. But I think that Andrew Clavin talks about this from time to time. I, I, I'm loath to agree with Andrew Clavin on anything. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on just this one thing, he, he did christen me the God King. So on these two things, yeah. <laughs> I agree with Andrew. Everything we're living through right now is because we as a species— have not evolved to under to know what to do with the internet. You know, the the Protestant Reformation in many ways was a reaction to the advent of the printing press. That it it seems funny to us so far down the road from the printing press. The printing press was such a remarkable leap forward in technology. 
for human beings. Suddenly there was information available to everyone that formerly had only been available to the very, very elite few. And to come to grips with that took two generations and a war that pro that wiped out millions of people in Europe, like uh, that ripped the church asunder, that ripped the world order asunder. They printed words on paper and the Protestant Reformation happened basically as a result. And it's always that way when you have these moments of, you know, in many ways, uh, World War I was a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. When there's these enormous leaps forward in technology, people don't know what to do with it. It takes a generation or two. The, the Internet literally rewires our brains. It has, it has biological uh, uh, r ramifications. We have so much information, more information than any human being knows what to do with. We have not solved how to take in all that information, how to sort through all of that information, how to come to conclusions. And so what we've done is we've the same thing we did when the printing press happened. We've just become more tribal. Since I, I can't sort through all the information, I have to believe that Tim knows how to sort through the information. I have to believe that Jordan Peterson knows how to sort through the information. I have to believe that Ben Shapiro knows how to sort through the information. I have to believe. And the problem with that is some of the sorters are better than others. Mm. Mm. I was wondering, uh, you know, Joe Biden recently came out and said uh, he he, he uh, referenced the fourth turn, the fourth turning, the Strauss-Howe generational theory. Are mm. you you're familiar, mm. I, I imagine? He said, you know, between 1900 and 1946, you know, what do you say, 60 million people died. Yeah. There, then there was a liberal world order. There'll be a new world order. I was wondering, we, we, we talked a bit about how we, how we brought that up, but I thought to myself, why was it that so many people died between 1900 and uh, 1946? You know, what was the catalyst for these emergent ideologies that, that, that opposed each other so, so, so fiercely? And I wonder if it was radio. All of a sudden, Big we got time. serialized yeah. radio programs, radio news. Mm -hmm. Hitler used mass media. Exactly. That was how he became Hitler. So imagine that we know you are the average person and there's a handful of newspapers. The newspapers mostly homogenized to maximize profits. So they may have slightly differing views or they might be yellow. It might be yellow journalism. But for the most part, your information moves slowly. So radicalization is slow. Along comes radio, which is more rapid. It's on, you know, frequently and there's multiple channels with different perspectives. Now they're finding new audiences because they have more opportunity to send out those messages in real mm. time. I wonder if that played a big role in radicalization, which, you know, give or take 10, 20, 30 years results in major clashes in war. Yeah, as it's actually a good thing. Most humans don't have time to, to just live reading the internet and reading mm. the news and sifting through the news. And sort of they're, they're busy working for a living. They're busy raising their kids. And so they, they need people to help them with this fire hose of information that now comes our way. And yeah, I'm sure radio was very similar. I'm sure I know the printing press was. One thing I'll say to, to bring it full circle to my conversation about wh why conservatives tend not to build the future, it's because, yes, perhaps the Second World War was a result of radio. Perhaps the explosion in, in the isms, fascism, socialism, communism, uh, anarchism, maybe it was all a result of radio. I think that's a really compelling theory that you bring up. Uh, conservatives did get around to being on the radio, though, in 1980. So I just want to I just want to say after 60 million people were yeah, killed because boy. of radio yeah. uh, a generation later, we got some. No, I, I think it's an interesting point. And conservatives have done a very poor job keeping up with mass communication, with the artistic fields. I mean, you look historically so much of the beautiful art that we see in the West was basically commissioned by the Catholic Church. Nowadays, I mean, what fraction of media does the Catholic Church, let alone any group you'd call conservative in general, control? It's a very small proportion. And I think part of that could just be the nature of the way people who tend to be more, uh, quote unquote, progressive are willing to experiment with new technology. You were sort of discussing the fact that conservative investors would be less likely to put money into an app that they can't see a direct utility in the way a left wing person might be capable of. I, I'm not sure. But I, I also think when we talk about left wing people today, we're not really talking about the left wing of 20 years ago, even though they have similar ideological roots, because I think many of them today wouldn't invest in these. Sorts a healthy of society needs a healthy needs healthy liberals. Mm. The reason conservatives don't conservatives have never made art ever. The Catholic Church didn't make any art. It bought art mm -hmm. from much more liberal people like Michelangelo. The, a healthy society has healthy liberals. <laughs> An unhealthy society has ascendant leftists. Why, that's, why a, that's a big difference. I'd have to think why about that. Why don't we make gargoyles thing. anymore? Yeah, let's bring well, it back. Well, no, no, no. no you, like, I, we should make some, put them around the, the castle. I'm, I'm totally so, doing it. No joke. 3D prints no, 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 and no, large joke. gargoyles. We, we, have, we have a lot of work and expansion we're doing. I'm getting gargoyles. Do because it. you look at all of these, and I'm half kidding about gargoyles. But you look at modern construction, and it's like glass steel boxes. Boring. That's right. Yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no art or, mm. or inspiration. 
And then I'm thinking about a lot of the a lot of churches and a lot of older buildings, gargoyles. And I'm like, that sounds kind of like a, if somebody was a fan of the Lord of the Rings, they'd be like, I'm building a house. I'm gonna put a gargoyle. You gotta have tubes out of their mouth that shoot fire, though. Oh yeah, they're There's just like at that will you can push the. Button. I don't know if that's legal, but we See, can that, certainly have it spray water. You just have it shoot electricity. Or you're something. more conservative than I thought because that's a very practical. <laughs> that's not a non-artistic practical thing that you just uh, that you just suggested. You know, regarding the fire hose of information you're talking about with the internet, I would love to be able to understand all the information on the internet without having to read it or watch it. So Neuralink. I'm thinking of neural link. Mm. It's it's a bit esoteric because it hasn't come out yet, and I wonder if it's like we invented the fire hose, but we don't have any of the the mechanism to. to to control it really or, or very about, very rudimentary think about how crazy it's going to be when of course it has its own problems so they, they actually refer to all the tweets on twitter as the fire hose yeah you know so if you want to access the api for certain information or whatever and some companies do it to site like there, there's so much information on twitter i gotta tell you they i i would be willing to bet the, the, the twitter fire hose has been plugged into an ai a long time ago and it's like Calcul it knows everything happening. It's an oracle at this point. I should also specify, I don't know if I want to see everything on the internet because the mind can get oh, warped yeah. by crazy well, stuff. Look, look, violence look, is, and real quick, um, you through Twitter's information with everyone posting things, just think about what happens in New York City mm. when a, uh, let's say a transformer explodes. Instantly, you're going to have 3,000 tweets all saying, I heard this explosion. Instantly, those with access to the geolocation data are going to know exactly where all of those people are. Instantly, the AI is going to be able to get this circle on a map of all these people saying they heard an explosion and then be able to triangulate where the explosion was basically based on how many people are tweeting about it. They'll know exactly where that is instantly. Mm -hmm. Think about anything in that regard that people might talk about, be it a storm, be it a, a flood. There's going to be AI that has access to, to, to this fire hose. Now, what happens when you plug into the metaverse and they can download that rapid information, people will become like, I don't know, man, what people will become, but you'll just know everything all at once. And that's, that's, it's going to be an experience. I'll tell you that. You need well, to see I, the, this is the funny code. because you, you made this point earlier about how it, it's good that most people can't just sit online and consume information all day. And we have this saying, right? People joke about going outside and touching grass. It's like, all right, bro, you're too <laughs> online. There's this idea of being terminally on the internet to the point where you just can no longer recognize and contend with reality. And so if people do get plugged into that point, my goodness, I don't even know what political ideology they'll have because some 14 year old will spend hours and hours and hours online and end up in more and more bizarre, esoteric corners of well, the so political internet and claim that that's their view. Th th this is happening. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with this. We've talked about it quite a bit. Uh, are you familiar with um, Elsa Gate? No. So this was something that happened uh, about four or five years ago, where YouTube was inundated with people dressing up like Elsa from Frozen, hmm. Spider Man, oh, yeah. the Joker, and then uh, so it was these weird videos with no length, in, uh, with like no speaking, just music, and the Joker would chase Elsa and Spider Man would save her, and it was because algorithmically those characters generated a lot of hits and recommendations. <laughs> so people made content for children, but this began to devolve. Eventually, the people who made the content, many of these people realized it's babies watching this stuff. Babies can't change the channel. It's the autoplay feeding the content. So they used computer programs to procedurally generate content with these keywords. You ended up with videos that were very bizarre. Like uh, there's one video, one of the most notable in this space was a uh, Adolf Hitler, but his, his body is a woman in a bikini doing Tai Chi as some Indian family sings finger family nursery rhyme. And the Incredible Hulk is also like, you know, doing like some kind of boxing maneuver. The reason was it didn't matter what the content of the video was. It, would, uh, it didn't matter. All that mattered was the keywords were in it. Nursery rhyme, finger family, the Hulk, for some reason, Hitler, I guess. These things were shocking and generated recommendations. Children grew up watching this stuff. Mm -hmm. So when, when Ian said, I'm sorry, when Seamus is talking about their warped perspective, we are going to have 12, we, we probably have it now, 10 year olds who are unsupervised on the internet watching the craziest stuff you've, you've ne you'll never understand, abstract nonsense of, you know, the Incredible Hulk and Hitler dancing together. And when those people grow up, they're going to have insane views that make no sense because when we grew up, we're older, right? With Shame, I think Seamus is the youngest person. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I don't know. He's, yeah, he's the youngest person here. 27 so today. Happy birthday. My, my parents had, were living in reality. All of our parents were living in reality, mm -hmm. even with Seamus being the youngest person. But what about one of these kids who's 10 years old today, when they have their first kid and the values they transfer down to those children 
are telling the great story of Hitler's uh, female female Hitler's Tai Chi against the Hulk as their as their story or whatever. Like these these things are going to be pro- wired into their brain. When I was a little kid, the things that were wired, in, wired into my brain were Superman, you know, mm-hmm. Batman, Star Trek, The Next Generation. Those values carry forward. If little kids are being are developing around psychotic algorithmic nonsense, yep, they're just going to be insane. I just in typed in Elsa Gate too to get a look, and I mean, there's some crazy stuff. Girl drinking a beer, like a baby drinking a beer yep. with a Spider Man. Yo, there's Elsa yeah. Gate had had cartoons on YouTube of little kids drinking urine. This is like R rated content it, in the guise stuff. of no, a cartoon. Yeah. Uh, I actually know someone who told me that their child came across content on the internet that was supposed to be Peppa Pig. And it was actually oh, yeah. Peppa Pig describing some extremely violent things and actually basically telling the kids to do violent yep. things. Very disturbing. Very yeah. disturbing. Yeah, I think one of the things that's missing in our culture now is cultural literacy. Mm. And it's not a topic that gets discussed much. It probably should be discussed a lot more. That when we were kids, uh, the the Western canon, the, which, which a canon is important because it's essentially a set of stories and ideas that we all share. Uh, the Western canon was baked into all of the fiction that we ingested. Mm-hmm. So I learned the, the famous story of uh, uh, of Tom Sawyer convincing his friends to whitewash the fence, right? That's right. I learned that from Looney Tunes. I yeah. didn't learn it from reading Huck Finn. You couldn't, you know, a, a seven-year-old can't read Huck Finn, but a seven-year-old could watch Looney Tunes. I learned about classical music from Looney Tunes. You know, I, I think that that, that idea that we have a shared heritage, that we have a shared fiction, even a fictional, a legendary uh, heritage, you know, the, the stories that we all know uh, is completely gone. And to your point, I, I think we are already seeing the results of it. There's never been a generation with more psychoses oh, yeah. than young people today, right? I mean, I think it's going to get substantially it's worse. It's going to get substantially people don't, worse. People yep. don't understand. We've, we've been, uh, I've been kind of obsessed with talking about the metaverse just mm-hmm. because I've been, you know, it's, there's, there's, I, I read news, I read politics, I read culture, and all of these cultural stories that keep popping up just lead me to the singularity. You know, that, that's what I think people call it. Alex Jones calls it that. Mm-hmm. The metaverse is a path towards this, you know, unification of man and machine or whatever. It's a Ray Kurzweil thing. Yeah. yeah. So the one, one of the things I mentioned was that a lot of what we're experiencing in, in, in the culture war with the transgender issue is actually um, due to technological advancement. Now, I'm not making a social commentary on this. I'm making a, t- a scientific one. When we isolated hormones and then in the 1960s started creating hormone therapies, this led to a, a, a sort of understanding of what hormones can do to the body, which reads, leads us to the 90s, where hormone replacement therapy becomes more popular, which results to, in the 90s, you now have prominent adults who have underwent or undergone hormone replacement therapy, now sharing those ideas and expanding that idea. Uh, again, not a social commentary, a scientific one. If the debate we're having now, because of the existence and the isolation and creation of hormones and that technology has resulted in this culture war debate, what will happen when we start shifting into metaverse spaces? Mm -hmm. When we're plugging our brains in or virtual reality to go to work, already on Twitter, many people use cartoon avatars or animals as their their profile picture. What happens if we really do, and I think we will get to that point where we have our business meetings in a high-res metaverse? And someone shows up to work, and it's Tony the Tiger or some giant ostrich, and they and they say you can't discriminate on me on, oh, as how on how I choose to represent myself in the metaverse mm-hmm. environment. So right now, if you look at New York City's human rights law pertaining to gender identity, mm-hmm. uh, it's specifically defined as self-expression. No joke, literally, it's mm-hmm. defined as self-expression. Yeah. And uh, I, I, this is something I've t- I, I, I actually and you're literally not expressing yourself. <laughs> it's true. Well, I mean, oh, yeah, it's you're, no, it's true. Well, so, so, so uh, uh, I covered the story and I, and I actually called the city and I called some lawyers to, to, to get some understanding on this. This was back in, I think, 2018. It was uh, New York announced that they had 31 genders in their, in their public listing. <clears throat> so their human rights law specifically says, if you are in any of these categories of gender or gender identity, you are a protected class. If anyone discriminates against you, it's a $125,000 fine. If they willfully discriminate, it's a $250,000 fine. So I looked into the law, and it said gender identity is defined as self-expression. They can't discriminate against you based on your name or the way you dress. So I called several human rights lawyers, and I asked them for an understanding of this. And I said, how, how can a workplace determine what is reasonable or not in terms of someone's name and expression and clothing? And they said, well, we all know what's reasonable. A judge knows what's reasonable. That's why judges exist. If you go into their courtroom with something unreasonable, they'll tell you you're unreasonable and it doesn't, it doesn't fit the law. And I said, okay, 
What if someone went to Starbucks and they told the person, you know, I want to work here. They get hired. But on their first day, they show up in a full wolf costume with with like lifts. So they're six foot five. And they say that their name is Volciferon, Herald of the Winter Mists. You can't discriminate on the basis of my name or my clothing. The lawyer, uh, I was told this by several lawyers. They all said, good luck going into a courtroom and telling a judge that you are Volciferon and they need to allow you to wear a wolf costume in Starbucks. And I said, would not the same thing apply to a man wearing women's clothing whose legal name is John saying his name is Jane? Why would the judge have the discretion to determine whether or not it falls within the the, the, the legal definition of self-expression? Because if you're telling me that someone can't choose to be a furry and furries exist, and they, and, you know, I don't think they're all calling themselves full Sephiron, but they have, you know, specific names and costumes. Why would a, a transgender person be afforded rights that another person in a similar fashion would not be? And they had no answer for me other than we think a judge would find it unreasonable. And then I, I said, wouldn't it stand to reason then you could appeal and say any judge could find a transgender person unreasonable. And that would create very serious problems based on this, civil, this, this human rights law. That's where I think we're headed. Now, once we get into the metaverse, you're going to see that very same thing happen. You're going to be you're going to be around people who say I am a carrot. This is my identity, identify as carrot, and you won't be able to fire them or or admonish them. You'll have to just say um, you know, Robo is a carrot. He works here. You might be able to make it so no one else can see the carrot when they're in the boardroom, but they only see the base avatar or something. I don't I don't I don't know about that. Um that would that would be like saying if a protected class of any of any type, gender, race, national origin came to a workplace, you could cover them up so none of the empl- none of the customers could see them. You could say like you can express yourself however you want, but you can't make me see you. That's up to me whether or not I see you. Tough questions, man, because they're saying in workplaces you have to use pronouns. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's interesting because one of the points you made was that somebody said, "Well, good luck getting in front of a judge and having them take that argument seriously." I don't think you need luck. It's possible you just need a couple of years because our <coughs> our social structures are shifting so quickly yeah. that even going to court as a transgender person, right, and saying I am a um, a woman trapped in a man's body, you're discriminating against me if you don't acknowledge that. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, a judge would have said that's absolutely absurd, absolutely. but today they wouldn't. Right. Yeah, this is actually why things are moving so quickly that even we can't carry on a, a real conversation about real about what's actually occurring mm. when when any of us sit at a table and we talk about the trans issue we still use terms like men and women we still think fundamentally if a man says that he's a woman if a man named john walks into starbucks and says i'm a woman and we think that that's what the trans conversation is really about but when you read statistics like 40 percent of kids now are trans or whatever these crazy statistics are they're not having conversations about being men men trapped in women's bodies they're having conversations that are so far beyond that it's not it's not always the furry conversation but to your point there are 33 there are 72 there are 40 the, this, the this, number of genders it's sort of like when when conservative parents say oh i can put my kid in college you know it was liberal when i was there and i came out just fine and you're like you have no idea what's actually happening on a college campus right now this, this is exactly yeah. my point that um because of the 90s and the technological advancement around hrt 30 years later we're having a conversation around transgender issues mm-hmm. but kids today they're talking about you know other kin are you familiar That's with right, other kin? yes people who think they're mythical beasts or mythical animals. And when it comes to the metaverse, this won't be a question. It they will be, will be. They will be. And give it 50 years. If we're neural linked into alternate realities and digital realities, a lot of the work, the work we're doing right now could be held in a metaverse space with high quality microphones mm-hmm. and ultra high, you know, ultra, you know, 10K, 12K video. We could, we don't have to be sitting in the same room or fly people out. We could all put on our headsets and then people will watch a video of us in a room together. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. They'll so sit in the room with Yeah, us. exactly. I was going to say exactly. someone could place themselves they in will. that chair. And you know what's funny is 10 years ago, I pitched this to Vice. I pitched it to Fusion. I said, we do a show where in one chair, it's a 360, um, um, what's the what's the word? Binocular. Um, what's the word? I just call it camera. Stereoscopic. Oh, cool. Yeah. Stereoscopic 360 oh, view, <laughs> which allows you to see like you're actually there. But the resolution was really bad, but we could still try it. That's coming. Oh, yeah. Now, if you get to the point where you can actually have full sensory feedback, like Neuralink would, would, allow, would potentially allow you to do, if we can actually wire a brain, people are literally going to be like, in this space, I am Volciferon, the wolf lord of, you know, the, the arboreal forest. 
And you'll be watching a show of a giant wolf creature and it will look like reality. And the wolf will be like, I take issue with the president's anti-wolf policies. <laughs> and people are going to be like, wow, it must be crazy being a wolf. Yeah. And then and, that person and, will become a CEO. Yeah, and the boomers will still be presidents in real life. They'll, they'll still run the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I think what you're saying is right, but I do want to challenge us a little bit. It is the nature of... Uh, it is the nature of contrarians to, and the nature of conservatives. Uh, not that I want to label you all as that contrarians though, to look at the future and only see the worst things that can happen. And mm. the worst things that can happen will happen. Well, hold on I'm now. not suggesting that those things won't occur. You're right. They will occur. See, well, well, so this is a point I was making with a, with a few other people. Me describing the potential future through the metaverse is not a moral statement, good or bad about it. Mm -hmm. It's just something I see as a potential. Well, but you I, do see it as something bad. Yeah, and I, and I think that the potential that you're outlining, some version of it will come to pass. It's, an, it's, not, that, it's not that when we look ahead and say, oh, you know, we're going to have to be in business meetings with, with Vulciferon, that we're wrong. We probably, that is one of the things that will occur. Uh, everything that people put their hands to, because, because people are fallen, because people are broken, the things that we create reflect our brokenness. Uh, but they don't exclusively reflect our brokenness. And I think that what we have to do, people in this room, people who, who think in the directions that people in this room think, we have, to, we have to be active parts of the construction of the future so that it doesn't just represent our brokenness. It can also represent a lot of the good things, a lot of the values that we share, a lot of the things that we would like to see uh, uh, expanded. Here's what I want you to consider, too, something that um, most people probably don't realize. If the metaverse reality comes to pass where you can choose your identity— Mm -hmm. You, Jeremy, will be sitting at a Daily Wire meeting. You'll have hired a young man named, you know, Ricky Smith. Mm -hmm. But when he shows up on the first, first day in the metaverse, he looks identical to you. And he says, my name is Jeremy. This is my identity. And if you retaliate against me because of my identity, that's discrimination mm -hmm. on the basis of who I am in my name. And it's some, they want to be you. People don't want to be themselves. The people who look up to you, they'll just say, I'm going to be this person. The number of people that. who wish that they were me is staggeringly so wrong. can you imagine <laughs> being in the metaverse <laughs> yeah. walking down the street and then there's like 10 of you and then they look at you and they're like you're not the real jeremy are you and you're like no no not me nope, and they're like nope. okay well then the question is do you yeah do you have the ip of your own likeness but because you we'll have to buy a non fun uh, you'll have to buy a non-fungible <laughs> token of yourself <laughs> you will like have to pay someone else for it someone yeah. buys this the company responsible very interesting for because mo uh, modern like media law when like Disney has a contract with the guy playing Thor whoever that what's that guy's name Chris is his name Chris Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth. Hemsworth. they yeah. have him on contract saying they own his likeness in perpetuity forever in every universe henceforth which mm -hmm. means if they ever want to make a uh, a deep fake with Chris Hemsworth saying whatever they want they own that yo this was they the own plot. Chris Hemsworth's likeness now this was a plot of 30 of 30 rock episode where uh Jack Donaghy took all of the Seinfeld episodes because they own the likeness of Jerry Seinfeld and superimposed him into other shows. So they would yeah. take, it was actually, and then Jerry Seinfeld finds out and he gets really mad. So we need to rewrite then, it. Oh, but just, just really, really funny because I love the show. Jerry Seinfeld finds out and he's like, uh, he's like, I could buy your network 10 times over. And then Jack's like, you don't have $4 million. Like <laughs> it's, um, We're going to need to rewrite entertainment law really rapidly too, because uh, I don't think corporations should own the likeness to actors anymore because of the deep fake meta net that we're entering. That's interesting. That's, that's actually a really good point. You know, I've been excited about these technological advances because of Star Trek, the animated series, which is uh, an old one. Uh -huh. yeah, wow. But here's, here's the thing that occurred to me recently is that, some of the best Star Trek writing, I mean, the, the third season of the original series of Star Trek is garbage. The first season is some of the best sci-fi ever written. And the animated series is some of the best sci-fi that was ever written. And it occurred to me very recently. After the next generation. Yeah, we're moments away from them making live action versions of Star Trek, the animated series with the original cast. It's already their voices. Right. They voiced the animated characters. And now a remake, an animated remake would essentially be deep fake level 
reality, right? They can just make that show now. And they can put Jerry Seinfeld in it. And then Jerry Seinfeld will show <laughs> up. Well, that's the deal. Wow. So <laughs> With we, the Romulans. We've had this, well, that's what So it would be like, like a basic human right is you own the IP to your likeness forever, henceforth. But I think there's no. an argument to be uh, made. And, and, that, unless you trade it for some Ethereum. I think yeah, that's oh, if yeah, you need yeah, Ethereum. Now, I'm not saying this is the argument I would make, but someone who was in favor of people being able to redistribute their likeness would say, well, you own it, therefore you have a right to sell it. So you could sell it to a network. Maybe that's where you're going to get hit. Maybe with. you're not legally allowed to sell it, but maybe license mm. it for uh, a, with a sunset Yo. clause. I mean, I mean, just Ready Player One. Have you guys seen it or read? Mm. Not I the, mean, yeah, not the yeah. people. Thing, right? People were cartoon characters. They 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 would go into the game and they'd make themselves whatever they wanted, you know. And in fact, in that movie, there was a, a one of the, one of the in-game characters, a dude, was actually a woman in real life. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're. It's it's not that like the Gnostic heresy version of the metaverse won't come to pass. It will. <laughs> that has to yeah. version. But, but there but yeah. there will also be there there's also beauty to be found in the future we we have to go build it we it, we are not victims of circumstance the worst thing to be as a human is someone who who perceives themselves as powerless uh perceives themselves only to be a victim of sort of the fates around them right mm -hmm. we we can go make it we can make it better. We can answer some of these questions in advance. We can build structures that constrain some of the worst excesses that could come to pass. But we won't. We'll just say 30 years later that we should have had our own metaverse. No, I think we will. No, we'll I, build this metaverse with free software so that you can see the uh, the algorithm codes and you know if it's extracting your thoughts or not. And then you'll be able to pass it off and create new meta nets that will all interoperate and you'll have like an open system. Babies will well, be born and the doctor will say to the parents, do you want the, we can do the uh, Neuralink implant today. We can do it right now while your baby's in the other room. And they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, truth be told, what'll, what'll likely happen is they'll call you on the phone and be like, hello, Mr. Johnson, your test tube baby was born and we did the Neuralink implant. You can pick them up at five, bye, click. Mm -hmm. The next generation is the opposite of the original series because the really? first season sucks and the third season starts to be good. I think it the first season better was better. awkward. No, you don't. You don't think the first yes, season I do. of the next season. It that introduces is, Q. That is absurd. It was awkwardly acted, I thought. That, that sure. is absurd. Mm -mm. It's funny. That, that, it all start, the best of both worlds is the greatest achievement in the history of television until Game of Thrones. And, <laughs> oh boy. and, then, and after the, the and after season. yeah and after the best of both worlds it becomes a great television well, show that's an episode the best of both worlds mm, it's two episodes oh mm. which one is Locutus of Borg yeah oh no. my goodness yeah yes Borg was such good, was good writing episode. too it's, yeah. un it's unbelievable and after that you know they they brought the high collar in they got the cooler phasers they got the new yeah. model everything got cool. But man, those first couple seasons, it's the love boat in space. See, I, <laughs> this I love is it. this is all this is it. our Western well, uh, canon. The future generations needed a Star Trek. It's yeah, Disney, did. man. Yeah. Dude, I, I Disney's posted, not Disney I posted anymore. this clip because there are so many people who are naysayers. I, I'm I'm surprised there are people who would watch a show like this, but also be like, I'm not watching Star Trek. Yeah, and I, and I'm just like, no, no, no. You don't understand. We're not talking about. Wouldn't it be cool to be in a spaceship with lasers? We're talking about. Naval tradition. We're mm -hmm. talking about military officers mm -hmm. defending uh, the freedom and civil liberties mm -hmm. of individuals, going to planets where they experience terrorism. The uh, that that line uh, when Data goes to Picard and says, "I'm having trouble understanding," you know, the conduct of these people. They're engaging in terrorism, and then Picard says, "I do not uh, subscribe to the belief that political power is derived from the barrel of a gun." And then Data says, "But if you look at history, and then he names." Like two real examples, but then fictional future examples where terror actually worked. And Picard's like, these are questions that humanity struggles with. Like, that's why yep. the show is good. Yeah. The philosophical well, and moral explorations. And I, I was being somewhat facetious, but there is a component to the fact that Star Trek did often include the great work. So they, they reference Shakespeare. You have that's episodes right. about, you know, Greek mythology. They really included things that today most people are completely unaware of, which is sad. But you could actually, like, learn about them from Star Trek and then start to do a deep dive because kids aren't learning it in school. That's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do have a special soft spot for like laser beams, though, when they like roughhouse with an alien you know dude what? in a costume. Of course. I do too. One of my least favorite things about all the new iterations of Star Trek, starting with the J.J. Abrams and all the way through Picard right now, is that they've basically gotten rid of phasers and everything's just a Star Wars style blaster now. Phasers yeah. to mm. stun, man. They, and, they call they them were, phasers, but they don't have beams. They're like little bolts. But they were they were little clickers. The, uh, in mm -hmm. the next generation, they were miniaturized little clickers. They would just point, which would be very difficult to aim. Oh, yeah, you head. couldn't. I think every time I watch The Next Generation, I just think, you just killed everybody. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> like, what is this? I wonder you if they aim the themselves. That, uh, yeah. Well, one of the things the that was, was positive about it, and the, the reason uh, my dad used to watch it with us as kids is because his view, he told us when we got older, was that it was very much a positive influence because 
they would exhaust every peaceful option they could, but they would still fight when they had to. So it wasn't completely pacifist, but they were all about seeking the nonviolent solution when possible. Hmm. And they didn't yeah. hesitate in the face of, of, of threat. They would exactly. fight immediately. They, they would they... fight when they needed to. Yeah. Oh, man. The, the original Picard's... series was so pro-American. I grew up in the next generation. I love the next generation, right? I'm a sucker for all Star Trek. Uh, but the original series is like morally and philosophically so much better because it's deeper and richer. It was at the height of real sci-fi, especially the first season and a half, where they really were asking all these questions for the first time. Mm. And you have these episodes where like Captain Kirk will beam down to a planet that is utopia. Everyone there has all the food they can eat. They have, it, it never rains. You know, there's no hail. There's no weather. Everything is perfect. And he'll look around and say, this place is crap. I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna go destroy the computer that has made you all mental slaves. Yeah. And he'll go. To sh he'll ruin their utopia to set them free. And you. You talk about things you can't do on television now. Mm -hmm. You could never say that utopia is bad because people aren't free. That's so true. That's, That's interesting. So this is what people topic. have pointed out. Have you been following the new Picard? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, I. I don't think I'm gonna watch. I, it. Yeah, I, I mm -hmm. didn't even bother. I, I didn't mind season one of Picard. Um, but season two, for those that aren't aware, is about, uh, you know, what is it, the 2022s or whatever? The 2020, or, yeah. 20, 2024. 2020s or whatever? 2024. 20, well, uh, so the Star Trek crew, Picard, which are in the future, have to transport themselves back in time to 2024 because something happened that turned Earth into a human supremacist planet. <sighs> right. And I'm just like, okay. yo, this is... The stupidest thing I have ever Political heard. Political propaganda. Oh, it's absolutely absurd, by the way. And I've seen I've seen every episode that's out so far. I can't help myself. But uh, I'm such a sucker for nostalgia. Mm. And the first season of Picard is terrible. But when you get to the end and we get the actual data Picard death scene that we were robbed of in the films, you go, yeah, I'll follow you guys through the gates of hell. Give me, <laughs> tell me how all humans are fascists. I'm in. I want to. I want to. You know, watch. yeah. They never talk about Vulcan supremacists. It's interesting. It's, but Vulcans but, don't have institutional power, so they're not. The the first thing is, it's clear that the Picard series is just you know member berries. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Remember the Borg? Remember Picard? <laughs> and then like they meet everyone, and it's like, oh, like yo, just give me a series that follows Deep Space Nine in in the continuity, and mm -hmm. we, we can move beyond the Dominion War, or whatever. For those that are fans, and uh, but instead, what they're doing is. We're going back in time again. Yeah, that's right. And the, the characters they bring back, you know, so uh, you've watched the first two episodes, I'd imagine, of Picard. First four, yeah. First four already out? Mm -hmm. Man, I've been working too much. Um, but Q does not feel like Q. You know, when, when he's like, this is not a lesson, Picard, it's penance. I'm like, come on. Yeah. Q is the guy who showed up with the mariachi band smoking a cigar and dancing, not some, like, torture of some great message or anything. He he's was just chaotic. Is, yeah. You're, right. not, you're, not, with him. you're yeah, not, he, you're not allowed to have fun. Right. This is what's different now. You're not allowed every. If you watch ads at the Super Bowl, uh, and they're all they're all important. The words you would use for the ad, the ad agent, they would say this was an important ad at the Super Bowl, yeah. or this was a beautiful ad at the Super Bowl, or this was a touching ad at the Super Bowl. And like, yeah, but where are the really funny ads at the Super Bowl? Yeah. I'm getting people keep writing in telling me that the Jeremy's Razor shameless plug. Uh, you can see it at IHateHarrys.com uh, <laughs> commercial. It, the people, hundreds of people are writing it. This is the best commercial I've ever seen. I'm very proud of the commercial. It's not the best commercial that's ever been made. Why they're responding that way is because it is the best commercial that's been made in a decade. Because you know, it's the my, first commercial in a decade where you can just laugh at it. And, it's and, good. And it's my, like Fall, like uh, what's that movie? Fall Guy? Is that what it is with Ryan Ryan uh, Reynolds? Reynolds? Fall Guy? Is that what it's called? No, no. Is that what the movie's called? Which one? When? Some movie that just came out where Adam he's like, Project? Free Guy. I think. Free Guy. Free, free Guy. guy. It yeah, felt yeah, like Free, free Guy, right. but like well, per, like almost like produced like on that level. And, well, and I just wanted to add, you know, uh, my uh, compliments to uh, the commercial were so good. The Daily Wire actually uh, picked that one up, pushed my video out, you know, because because you know, yeah, well, good it, commentary from Tim. Pool. Yeah, we need more like that. <laughs> you mentioned these uh, these people seeing their advertisements as important, and this is one of these things that if they could just step out of their little box for three seconds, they would understand how ridiculous it is. Just the phrase like "this is going to be the most important Coca Cola commercial." Of all <laughs> well, let, time. Let, me, let me. I want to go back to uh, yeah. let's let's throw, right back to Star Trek. How and why does a network uh, a company say? We have this, this IP, this popular IP. We have decades of storytelling and movies and series. Let's just put them in 2024 to fight Trump. I know why. That has nothing yeah. to do with any of the history. Like, if you want to make a show about time travelers who fight Donald Trump, make the show. Mm -hmm. I, I'd probably watch it anyway just to see what you're talking about. They, but why they make made, Picard do it? And they and then Star Trek Discovery, Stacey Abrams shows up as the president <laughs> of the United Earth. <laughs> Wow. 
Oh, uh, she actually got cheated out of that election. That's no, trash. Um, who are they speaking to? Themselves. Like, they're speaking I, to themselves. I, I honestly wonder if they're even doing that. It's really. funny. We, we were, oh man, I really wanted to get into this earlier, but it, it blew past us. And now's the perfect time to segue to it. You were discussing the, the Western canon. And part of why it's so important to tell good stories is because it's where people get their morality from. Mm -hmm. Yes, it helps to give people moral precepts and principles, but ultimately people are going to act on the basis of who they admire and the stories that they know. And so part of why they need to change these stories is because though they weren't perfect, some of them actually had decent values. And so what you need to do is retcon, retcon them yeah. and shove your own values into it so that you can this control is, people. This is what people say because uh, I tweeted a video from uh, The Next Generation mm -hmm. where... Uh, the 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 uh, an admiral at Starfleet orders Data to give up his child to the you know the state and Picard is like no and he risks his career he says men of good conscience will defy orders you you know to watch to have, to to compel a man to give his child to the state not while I'm captain and I was like man that was so awesome and then everyone said the new Picard series he would do the opposite mm -hmm. he would say for the for the betterment of the family we must allow you know and and for safety and security. That's what that's that's the message we'd get across now from Picard. Like his values are gone. Yeah, and that's kind of sad to me. The character should have been left left just as as as, as it was. But uh, they can't. They can't do it. They can't. They need to change because they can't create. They can't make new things. They have to pervert what other Not, people have already. Roddenberry, Roddenberry, like, Roddenberry that, is that, gone. This is, this is true, which is why t they take this long historic this this long history uh, history show and then change it. But it's also they want to destroy the, the the character Picard represented, the values he represented. They want to take him away as a role model from people who believed in these civil libertarian values. Yeah, this is freedom. one of the reasons that we got into making movies at Daily Wire is because so much content that exists now exists to tell you that you don't deserve these characters. And so, like, you know, you see it in these superhero movies uh, quite a lot. Like, you watch the beginning of uh, Endgame. And Captain America, who in the first in the first Avengers movie, Captain America says, you know, there's only one God and he doesn't wear tights. And he's mm -hmm. he's a character from the 1940s yep. who goes to it's, it lies about his age to go fight the Nazis. He wears red, white and blue and literally is called America. Yeah. That's the character. And then he gets frozen <laughs> in ice and he wakes up in the 20th century. And by in game, it opens up and he's in this counseling session. And we have to have the reveal that the person who is is sharing an insight with him is a married gay man a, a gay married gay man i would say a gay married gay man because gay men have been married throughout all of human history and it didn't mean what we mean now right <laughs> uh it's a gay married gay man and what why do they do why do that you can say well it's to be inclusive it's to show people that even gay married gay men have a place in the world but that's not why they do it if that's why they did it i might even go eh, okay we can we can live with, but that isn't the motive the motive is to say all of you red state flyover maga hat wearing uh, love America, wear red, white, and blue guys. Literal Captain America doesn't belong to you. Yeah. You don't get to claim him. He belongs to us. We can give him any set of values that we want. In fact, if you watch that whole Marvel Avengers arc, remarkably, Captain America becomes the uh, the renegade character during Civil War, and Iron Man, Tony Stark, becomes the representative of state power. Like, it's a... It's an unbelievable inversion of those characters because they don't know what the characters mean. It's not because they don't know. It's because they well, actually reject well, on, what the minute. characters stand hold for. Hold on. Do, are you, you're not familiar with the Captain America Nomad arc? I'm not, no. Captain America, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I'm not, I haven't read all this stuff. It was before my time. But there was a period where Captain America abandoned the name and called himself Nomad. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the point they were making was if you truly believe in America, you don't always stand by the government for whatever it does. Sure. So, you know, that's a general idea. I actually thought Civil War was fairly well done. I mean, Captain America was the guy saying, I'm not going to sign over my rights to the state. I'm, a, you know, I'm an individual. And Tony Stark is a, is a corporate warmonger who's that's like, take. the state, you know, is right. Sign, sign out. You know, we have to. I thought the, the, the politics in that were, were, were fairly good. Albeit the Marvel movies are like kindergarten grade entertainment. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Captain well, America's uh, war propaganda was created to fight Nazis and get people riled about World War II. And keep that in mind forever moving well, forward that that was war propaganda. Well, I, I want to make this point. Part of why it's so instructive that is Captain America is because the left has this fetish for project projecting their values onto the people who fought the Second World War. So they're always claiming that they're the ones fighting Nazi. Uh, you'll see memes floating around of the brave young men storming Normandy, and it says, this is Antifa trying to fight Nazis. 
Um, I did a cartoon about this a while ago called Fighting Nazis Then Versus Now. And what it was based on was this exact premise because my grandfather fought in the Second World War. He played a very key role in, in uh, ensuring that the um, officers at the Flossenburg concentration camp were caught and placed on trial. He really had an, an incredible and harrowing tour and he would not use your pronouns. I mean, this is not somebody who's going to uh, or would well, comply with left wing values. Yeah, exactly. I made a whole cartoon about this point, but it's so funny to me that the left wants to claim that they own these people, even though if, if they were alive today and those who are alive today from that era don't agree with them at all, if they even think about them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder if um, the speed at which we're communicating, the bifurcation of culture will just it's leading to some some say peaceful divorce. Perhaps mm -hmm. because of the internet, it could it could be something we haven't seen in the past, or civil war maybe. But I just don't see how there's any reconciliation with the the modern iteration of the, polit the the left sphere of influence because the things they believe are just not aligned with reality. I think it comes to the individual clearing, like having slowing down their thoughts. Because if your mind is moving super rapidly with the information, like a car traveling so fast on the road, a minor. Uh, variation in the wheel will send that thing flying off course and the same thing happens to your brain if it's on overload activity all the time so it's really i don't think there's a top-down solution it'll be up to people to control themselves and let this stuff flow past them while still acknowledging it are we doomed or is it going to be all right? I don't think we're doomed. I think both. I think yeah, things can get bad for right. a while. I think things might get bad for a while. I, I wouldn't say that we're doomed, though. I, I don't. I mean, it's pretty. It's a pretty easy prediction to say that things are going to get bad for a while. But also, in the long run, I don't know how things are going to turn out. I, I my my mentality is very yeah. much like I got to be honest with everybody. Um, you know, I had it bad most of my life. You know, up until my mid twenties, when you know, for the next you know few years, my career started taking off and things started generally improving. And so for me, my attitude's always kind of just been like, yo, all of this is icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. You know, if 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 people were unwilling to fight for their values and their va and everything fell apart, <clears throat> the food shortages get really bad. And I wake up, you know, in six months homeless and with no food, I'd be like, oh, you know, been there, done that. I'm not really worried about it. Mm -hmm. Granted, I don't have a family. So a lot of people who do would be much more terrified of something like that. If my tomorrow point, all the things were gone, I'd worked for all my life. Oh, yeah. If you had to start again, were you, just your children and your wife? Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Thank my luck a star. No, I just, there's a, uh, I think it was Zuby who said this, that if you took all of the property for, from every single person mm -hmm. and then gave everyone, you know, $10,000, the people who were rich before would become rich and the people who yes. were poor before would, would become poor. For the most part. This is a hard conversation. Maybe we can go to another after show because it really comes down to eugenics. Like this, this concept of eugenics, where it came from and what it all means. Like the, the fact that people even think of themselves as an elite class and that there's everybody else. And that, or, or or the plebeians is what the Romans called them, and then there's the central intelligentsia. Like I don't know, is that real? Like we just, like you just stated. Well, a lot of things are real. A lot of things that are unseemly are real, but not everything that's real is is. Um, not everything that's true is capital T truth. Like mm -hmm. I think that one of the problems. This kind of comes back to the ideology dogma thing. We we sometimes take observations that we make we, or measurements that we make, things that are true, and because you're not allowed to say a lot of things that are true in our culture right now. Um, it's it's uh, subversive to even think about them, and the result the result of that is that whenever you do engage with those ideas, you're engaging in them in the worst places possible with people who are like probably taking them to the furthest extreme, and it becomes easy for us to so you know like you become a eugenicist in your mind like Hitler was in the 20s and 30s or something, which is obviously a grave evil thing. I mean it's it's obviously true. Uh, uh, it's an obvious truth that simply because something is generally true, it's not specifically true, that because, uh, for example, Asian Americans have a higher IQ than, than white Americans, just to avoid any of the races you're not allowed to talk about. Uh, it's, it's, there's nothing racist about talking ill of Asians, right? So Asians, statistically, higher IQ than white people. But that, that The smartest person in the world could be a white person, uh, and it would still be true that well, statistically, you know, that statistically Asians have a higher IQ. So but you end up in this situation where the, the truth about the general truth can sometimes blind us to the specific truth. Uh, and that's where I think that's where a lot of tribalism, a lot of isms come from that, that aren't good. You get into the nuance of what is what does it mean to be Asian? Are you referring specifically to like Southeast Asian? Are you referring to the Philippines? Are you referring to India? Of course. And then th those things all play a role. I think the problem with stereotypes is that people hear the word Asian, and they exclude Indians. But particularly in Europe, you say the word Asian and they include Indians. Mm -hmm. So we're not even, you know, we're not even necessarily hitting at the same points. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I'm only making the point that w when we talk about these difficult issues like eugenics, uh, are some people are some people born with advantages? Of course they are. People are born with high IQs and people are born with low IQs. More people are born with low IQs than people are born with high IQs. One of the challenges in in ordering society is not letting is not judging people based on those generalities. But that doesn't mean that there aren't specific realities that people that people are different. There are people born with advantages. You can leave IQ out of it. IQ is the hardest thing to talk about because everyone is the smartest person they know. It's just your your own your ability to perceive someone smarter than you is capped by your own intelligence. Love it. But it's very easy for me to acknowledge that like LeBron James is better than basketball than I am. And you could say if I practiced really hard, I could be better than no I couldn't. If I practiced really hard, I could be better than me. But no amount of practice will make me better than LeBron. If LeBron didn't practice and I did practice, he would still be better than me. Now, if we played a game of uh Le LeBron and I play a game of pig, and instead of playing pig, we just play pu. And LeBron says, whoever wins this game of puh, you know, gets a million dollars. I might win the million dollars. Every now and then he misses. And every now and then I don't. But if you make it pi, his chances go up exponen exponentially. If you make it pig, they go up even radically. If you make it horse, I will never win statistically ever. There's no world where I will ever win that. He has those advantages. There's no question about those advantages. Let's go to Super Chats. If you haven't already, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends if you really do like it and you want to help us out, and go to TimCast.com, sign up to become a member to support our work, and we're going to have a members-only segment going live on the website around 11 or so p.m. You're not going to want to miss it. It'll be fun. But let's read some Super Chats. All right, we got Rilo who says, Applebee's is celebrating inflation because it kills competition and makes people poor. They note that more poor people means more disposable employees that can underpay and overwork. Applebee's hates you. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Is that something specific that happened? I didn't specific. hear anything about yeah. that. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, maybe this guy just got fired by Applebee's. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what if they just like really don't like Applebee's? Yeah, I don't know yeah. what happened. I'm going to Google this now. All right. Patriot American says, happy birthday to my fellow Irish American brother, Seamus. Oh, thank you. Good work, bro. Thank you. Very we, kind. We, oh, you guys are you too know, nice. <laughs> uh, we, 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 uh, I worked really, really hard to make a cake for Seamus. It was insulting. And it was, it was really it was it was. honoring <laughs> his okay. Irish heritage. Yeah. yeah that's really, I drew yeah. gold coins. You know, that's what the Redskins said. They put said they were honoring. shamrocks on it. <laughs> and I wrote McBirthday. He did, yeah. McBirthday. Yeah. That means son of birthday. It's just <laughs> racist. It's and, just... and this is a great... Everyone here is Irish. <laughs> this is a great way of looking back at the problem with stereotyping. That, exactly. no, you know, if, if I take a shot and he takes a shot, uh, statistically, I could become the alcoholic or he could <laughs> become the alcoholic. <laughs> yes. But if there's three uh, shots... If well, there's three three also, <laughs> I'm a writer too. So like oh Irish gosh, plus writer, yeah. I'm in even worse shape oh, for all yeah. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. Game over. I just, I, I think the joke's funny because Seamus is an American guy from the South Side yeah, of Chicago. Yeah, exactly. exactly. We're constantly yeah. calling I spent, him. I spent most of my life in the suburbs, let's be real. You know what I mean? I can't take all that street cred. <laughs> all right. Crayson says, it's not just about building culture. You have a culture and history already. You need to make people proud of the history and culture they already are a part of, not forget it and do something else. It's true. Yeah, I think it's true. I don't think it's all of the. I don't, I don't think that's enough, but that is a major part of it, and it's a part that we haven't talked about much tonight. So I think it's it's good that they pointed out. American Advocate says, "I'm so proud of the Daily Wire. They're not afraid of conversation or debate. The biggest cojones in America. I'm all in. Latinos for America. Woo. Oh, there you go. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, thank you. Um, we we take it as a responsibility, but I'll also say we're just having a good time too, and I think that uh, that's part of. What differentiates the Daily Wire is that we enjoy what we do. Man, I my thing is like, have fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. That's the point, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Hayden says, Jeremy, I'm from the Lub area. Thanks for yeah. what you've built. You hate credentialism. My question is, how would you recommend somebody get started in learning about video production? Yep. Working at Daily Wire has become a goal. Is SPC an option? They've gone woke. Yep. Uh, I went to SPC for, for a period of time. Uh, I, I didn't ever go to a university. I didn't get a college degree. I didn't right. even get an associate's degree. Uh, and I failed at everything that I did in life basically f until I was 35. I'd never made more than $25,000 in a year in personal income. I, I had businesses that made more money than that. I just paid it to other people mm. and, and didn't understand how to pay myself. And as a result, I had disconnected uh, my, own, um, my own personal success from the success of these entities. And I'd created sort of a false and, and crippling moral paradigm for myself. Uh, and obviously now I'm spectacularly wealthy and people bow to me and call me God. <laughs> right. and, uh, so, so my, my first thing as a guy from, uh, from the Lubbock area, as a guy who went to SPC, 
I just want to encourage you that uh, it doesn't matter what advantages you start life with. It doesn't matter what advantages uh, come your way. You can you can make of life what you will. You can you can set your mind to something and you can go accomplish it. That's not true for everyone in every place. It is true if you're born in this country. The proof is all around you. Opportunity is everywhere. You just have to learn, grow, challenge yourself, never be complacent. Don't stand still. Uh, don't be risk averse. If you want security, you can have it. But if you want uh, the kind of success uh, uh, that you're describing, you actually have to go risk for it. Now, as to how does one get the, the small steps, how does one get into video production? How does one get uh, even a job at the Daily Wire? I think that there is there's no substitute in life for doing. Mm. There are those in life who do, and there are those who do not. And this is my famed Jeremy's do, Doers and Do Notters speech. No one has ever been happy to receive it. No one is ever satisfied. They'll say, how do you do thus and such? I give this speech. They always think there's more. There isn't more. Yep. There are those who do, and there are those who do not. When I moved to Hollywood, I thought, I'm a smart guy. If I just met Steven Spielberg and he could tell me how to make a movie, I could take that and go make a movie. And then it was only after years of struggling in Hollywood that I came to realize that Steven Spielberg, if he, if I did get that meeting, what would he tell me? He would say, oh, you, you want to know how to make a movie? No problem. Find a book written by a famous author that you really like that sold a lot of copies. Give him a million dollars for a two-year <laughs> option on that book. Then... Go take meetings with 10 of the best writers in the world. Pay one of them a million dollars to write a draft. Yeah. You won't like the draft, so you'll pay the second guy on the list half a million dollars to rewrite the draft. When you have a draft that you like, call your buddy Tom Cruise and say, would you like to play <laughs> the lead in this? He'll say, yeah, and I'll be over for burgers this weekend. Now you've got him. Go to your business partners at your own studio that you own. Have them architect the foreign sales deal uh, piece of this and then go to the major studio with whom you have uh, a direct distribution deal and, tri and trigger it and they'll release it. Now, now you can make your movie. What good would that information do me if I had it? The real question, you're, the real question you want to ask is, Steven Spielberg, how, should, how could I make a movie? And the answer to that would be, oh, I have no idea. It's com Steven Spielberg knows less about how you could be successful than anyone. What you should do instead is realize that how did Steven Spielberg himself did it? Well, he just did it. Yeah. He well, just, what, he what, was a, he was a, those who do not a, those who do not. This is what I tell people because one of the most frustrating things I hear all the time is either Tim, you're able to do things because you have money. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's the inverse. It's the other way around. It's because I did things. I have money. Mm -hmm. And people saying, if only I had money, I could do thing. And I'm like, that's just not true. Yeah. I'm, I've seen it. I worked for fusion they put hundreds of millions of dollars into nothing, flush down the toilet. Yep. Money doesn't make things happen. People do. That's right. So whenever people are like, how do I do something? How do I do? I'm like, you just do it. You have, you have, like, like, how do I film these videos? I don't have a computer. I don't have cameras. I don't have all this stuff. Like, you have a phone? You do. Most right. people do. If you don't, truth be told, maybe you don't. But phones, you can get an Android phone for, for no joke, like 20 to 30 bucks. Not a good one. You can get a webcam for 20 to 30 bucks. You can go stand in a street corner in any yep. major city and hold up a sign saying, once I get 20 bucks, I'm going to buy a webcam to start a show. That's all I need. And in 10 minutes, I guarantee you, someone will walk over and hand you 20 bucks. That is American privilege because right. we do that. Not, I'm not saying it's the best thing to do, but how about this? You go work for a fast food restaurant. You work until you make, save up a couple, a couple hundred bucks to buy a computer and a camera, and then you can start making videos. And then you just have to earn it. You know, the idea that people are going to watch your content, it's got to be earned. That's you right. know, I was just talking about this band I knew a long time ago. Me and uh, uh, we were driving in a car. We were listening to this old music. And, you know, someone said, what happened to him? I'm like, they broke up because the lead singer was like, if my music was so good, how come I'm not famous? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, bro, you can't just write a song and then think you're going to be famous. Like, you've got to work for 10 years. You've got to keep playing. You've got to do, you got to put in so much work and effort. I got started doing all of this stuff technically well before I was 25 because I was working at nonprofits. I was involved in politics. I was reading the news all day, every day since I was 15. Yep. So when Occupy Wall Street started and I went to cover it, I already knew a lot about what had been going on. This allowed me to, you know, it's, it's all one thing after another. But let's, uh, let's, let's read some more Super Chats. Yeah, I, I love that story. And this, to me, nothing we've talked about tonight is more important than this. I, we, we've hit on it in several different ways, but this idea that you're just a victim of your circumstances is the is the most crippling the victim mentality is the most crippling ideology that has ever been unleashed on an individual you again not everywhere there are people born in true hardship around the world in this country you can do so i love oh, gary yeah. vaynerchuk for this reason i love that on saturdays he goes out and buys He's crap so at garage good. sales and then sells it and shows that you anyone 
could have done what he just did. You know the story of the guy who traded the paperclip for a house, right? That's right. And that, but several people have replicated this in various ways. He, a guy took a paperclip and he traded it up and up and on Craigslist and or whatever the story was. Paperclip for a pen, pen for a notepad, notepad for a pack of pens. Yeah. Eventually, he got to a, a lawnmower, then a bike, then a, then a broken motorcycle. Eventually, it was a boat. And then sooner or later, he traded it for an old house, got the deed from a paperclip. Because the, the difference between a piece of paper and a million dollar screenplay is what comes out of your brain and goes onto that page. That's it. Let's read some more. All right. David Short says, hey, Tim, just bought my first 10 chicks. Please mm. ask Jeremy where the razors are made. That's a non sequitur. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, our razors are made in China. We source them through Finland. There are no razors made in America. Interesting. Wow. What? Oh, razors sad. are not made in America. We, we, listen, sure one of the reasons works. it took us a year to get our razor out uh, is because we were trying to source razors. Uh, it's a very challenging thing. A razor is a thing that cuts people. Yes. So a lot of people don't want to make them. There are, there are um, uh, straight razors made in America. There aren't cartridge razor, razors made in America. Uh, we haven't talked about this much publicly. A lot of people will write into me all the time and say, because I'm conservative, and they'll be like, oh, you make your leftist tears tumblers in China. I'm canceling. And I always think, you wrote that on a computer or a phone that was made in yeah. China. I don't understand. It's not, I didn't decide to export all of America's manufacturing jobs overseas. That happened when I was a child. This is the world that I live in. I want to change that world, but... The reality of how to change that world is it takes time, success, and money. Just our leftist tiers tumbler is a great example. We have priced out what it would cost to manufacture the tumblers in America. Just the equipment would cost $20 million. So the cost of a tumbler would go from $20 per tumbler, not to people say, you just do it to save a few cents or a few bucks. No, no, no. <laughs> the cost of the tumbler would go from $20 to $200 per tumbler in raw material. Like, or which means like, it is, it's not impossible. It is, it is practically impossible. That's it is not actually, it's prohibitively. Yeah. Uh, now, will we ever make our razors in America? Will we ever make our tumblers in America? Well, I'm telling you what it would cost to make the tumblers in America because I know, because we're always researching how to change the paradigm where all of our manufacturing is, is overseas. We do think that we have a constructive role to play in that, but it's a role that one can only play out of success. We've talked to our friends over at Black Rifle Coffee, for example, about buying tumbler making equipment together, starting a joint venture. Mm -hmm. It's going to, t it takes real resources. It takes real success to make these razors in America. W four days ago, I did not own a razor company. Today, <laughs> I've sold 25,000 razor subscriptions. Like that, to do that requires buying razors where they already make razors. If, if we sell a million razor subscriptions, We'll build a razor company in America and we'll Ooh. change things. And it, by the way, if we get a million subscribers, it won't just be our razors that are made in America. Once we build the infrastructure to make razors in America, other companies will come source razors from us. So it's not that I'm opposed to the where is this made question. I'm what I what I kind of get I get a little bent out of shape about this because I think people don't really understand how how much we have exported overseas in terms of manufacturing Everything. and how much money and time it's going to take to fix that. And to think that, well, you shouldn't be able to start, a, a ra if you're a real American, you wouldn't even start a company until you could make the razors in America, it would just mean that you can't make anything. Hmm. I want to eventually manufacture things in America, which we will do in success. Absolutely. I, I love that people think, you know, a lot of people I saw on Twitter were saying like, I can't believe the Daily Wire would do this. Uh, and I'm just like, do you, I wonder if, do you think that you like the Daily Wire guys aren't thinking about that when when they you know why are they making that in China? It's like I'm pretty sure they know what people are yeah. going to say if they do and why they have to. Yeah, like these microphones were made in China and these laptops, laptops were made in China. Screens. That gorilla was made in China. Oh, like nice. it's going to take time Maybe. to change Is the that. On there? Huh, let's see what he says here. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely Chinese. Uh, there's never <laughs> well, this one has. Is that Chinese on the packaging? Okay. I don't yeah, know. This, this is a, this is a gift from Luke Rudkowski. That is Chinese. Yeah. yeah. Luke, it's, it's Luke, definitely part Luke of the Rikowski earth. Luke Rutkowski sent sent a birthday present made in China. <laughs> How I'm not against I'm it. Is, is this it mug is. made no, in China? No, we try. We, sure we, 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 uh... Yeah, we should change it. Yeah, this yeah. mug was made in China. To change it. You want to know the craziest thing? Tell me. How they make skateboards. Mm. Wood from Canada <clears throat> yep. gets shipped to the U.S., then shipped to China, turned into a skateboard, and shipped back to the U.S. Yeah. That sounds like the stupidest thing I've ever heard. A lot of people are taking a Chinese labor is so cheap. That it's cheaper to ship all mm -hmm. of that wood all over the place than just make it here in the U.S. It's also the EPA. Very famously, oh, sure. Steve yep. Jobs said only a year or two before he died, 
He said, if we had not been able to make the iPhone, if, if I had been required to make the iPhone in America, just the process of innovating around the class for the, for the screen on the iPhone. He said, I don't remember what iPhone we were on when Steve Jobs died, iPhone 6 or iPhone 6S or something. He said, we would not be at iPhone 1 yet. Yeah. If I had to make it in America. And that's because of environmental laws. And you could say environmental laws that Steve Jobs supported. Yeah, I'm not I'm not hey, I'm giving you a Steve Jobs <laughs> hey, geography. I'm just telling you, if a guy worth billions and billions and billions of dollars couldn't manufacture in America, have a little grace for those of us who are trying to start things from the ground up. Mike Allen says, if you joined late and are listening at 1.5 times speed to catch up, Jeremy sounds like Ben Shapiro. <laughs> oh. oh, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said about me. <laughs> All right, Josh, oh my gosh, says, how the frick can I get an acting job with The Daily Wire? I need a job I can enjoy. I'm an entertainer and I can't stand mm. Hollywood. Please let Jeremy know. I will send my resume to him. Yeah, uh, look, we need talent. Um, one of the challenges in our, in our work is because we're very front-facing, because we're very public. Uh, a lot of people you know, ask us for jobs and obviously you can't hire everyone who asks you for a job, but we are looking for real talent. We're looking for real talent in our entertainment business. We're looking for real ta talent in the manufacturing and distribution uh, of consumer goods business, which suddenly we have. Uh, we're looking for real executive and leadership and management talent at the Daily Wire. Scaling a business is incredibly hard. Everything about uh, being successful is hard. There's a great line in an episode of Breaking Bad when uh, the villain is making soup and he says to Walter White, uh, you must learn to be rich, to be poor anyone can manage. And it's true. Fa everyone knows how to fail. Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to succeed, and you have to keep learning how to succeed. Success can lead you to destruction just as quickly as failure can. Uh, and so at every turn as we grow this business, we need talent. So please, you know, reach at career careers at Daily Wire. Send, send us your resume. Send us your, uh, send us your um whether you're in entertainment or in business or, or whatever, we need good talent. When it comes you're, to acting, real, real, I, real, I feel uh, like the, the industry's changed and that the yeah. resume had shot things done now. And that I, what I want to see is that, and I, I want to see the real. Yeah. I, I want to see I video agree. of them. Yeah, go do something. Your, your, uh, your, your, your story is that uh, you, you failed up until, you know, you were 35. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Or what was, like you weren't making a lot of money and then all of a sudden you started yep. successful? The, the, started the Daily Wire. Uh, actually, it was the, the first time that I ever made more than $25,000 in a year was uh, at the precursor company that Ben and I had called Truth Revolt. Uh, and I got a nice salary. And at that time, Prager, you started paying me uh, a nice salary as well. Oh. So I, I was, or not a salary, but a nice consulting fee. Um, and so I was suddenly making, you know, six figures for the first time in my life as a 35 year old man. Uh, and it really is amazing how just that change of mind that Ben uh, and, and my friend Frank helped me achieve unlocked all of the actual power of economic incentive and, well, and between and between 35 and 43 i mean i i flew here on a private plane to do your show today wow so uh you're the one percent mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. were you shocked when you realized the laws limiting how you could spend money once you got large sums of money oh yeah this, this i bring this up because i can't tell you how many conversations i've had with people when they say things like hey why don't you just do this or that with your company i'm like that's illegal and they're like what right and I'm like, you can't just do that with money. That's right. there, there's limitations. There's financial limitations. There's laws. There's tax restrictions. There's tax holding requirements. All this crazy stuff. You can't just. You can't just. You can't even just give someone money. No, you can't give people money. Everybody's like, if you gave me a million, if I gave you a million dollars, I can't give you a million dollars, even if I had a million dollars to give you. The other thing people don't uh, that they don't understand is that when you are on a rapid ascent, the way that people of means are taxed is different. I don't pay taxes on April fifteenth. I pay taxes every quarter, right. and those taxes are based on projections of earnings that the IRS has rules about. And so there have been times over these last seven years where I was making an incredible amount of money on paper, but I was giving so much money to the government that I didn't know how I was going to pay my mortgage. Yeah. Like, it, it's unbelievable how they take that money from you. And if you make a lot of money in one year or one quarter— and then all of a sudden COVID hits and, and yep. revenues drop dramatically. Yep. They're like, we still expect your projections. You've got to pay. X You've got to pay yeah. as a percentage of last year's success. Well, the yep. government's job is to control the economy and giving it to the Federal Reserve is, is blatant disrespect for if you want rep if you want to represent me and you want my tax money, you better represent me and not outsource the representation to a private company. Let's let's uh, get sorry, but we gotta. Get, I want to try and get more super chats in. Uh, C. D. Stein says, "Ask Jeremy if he if they would consider also starting a book publishing company that includes comics, 
since the rise of insane wokeness in the big two two of comics. Yeah, well, we have started a book publishing company, right. uh, DW Publishing. Our first book um, uh, is with Sergeant Mattingly and is out now. Uh, we have uh, a couple of other really good books that are going to come out. Our, our first release was actually What is a Walrus by Matt Walsh, which was a children's board book. But our first, uh, our, our first um, adult publication is Mattingly's book. Um, we, we signed a a great book deal with Jonathan Isaac, the NBA player, which we're really yeah. proud about. And, and you know, that guy, uh, that guy stood up when other people were kneeling and, and we're proud to be in business with him. And we have, uh, only in the last four weeks, we have seen the first boards for uh, a graphic novel that we're working on. So this Ooh, is something that we're cool. pursuing. We're not pursuing it with the same sort of aggressive vigor that we are our entertainment play. It's a place where I would say we're testing. Um, not, not, not that we're, uh, charging. It's not a hill we're charging. It's a place where we're testing. But uh, obviously, we think the creation of IP, the creation of comics, the creation of graphic novels, the creation of fiction, you know, again, one of the things that makes us different from other conservative companies, even in publishing, is that we're not just going to publish a bunch of nonfiction. I have a really great idea for a children's book. It's called The Donkey Who Cried Bear. It's about a family, oh, we, a, a, a village of donkeys, and one donkey keeps screaming, the bears are coming. The bears are controlling our donkey president. You know, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. But but then what happens? I'm at actually the end? kidding. Tim, what but, happens at the end? <laughs> Tim, the I, bears, thought, I thought we the were bears invade. The elephant charges in. <laughs> yeah. Did you? Uh, what's the what's the model like? The cost model for Daily Wire right now for a you for someone that wants to subscribe to the network? Yeah, I mean, head over to dailywire.com slash subscribe and become a member. The, there's a couple of different tiers. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Use promo membership. code Tim Pool to get 25% off. Oh, so Use yeah. promo code Tim Pool wow. to get 25 Is that is that a real promo code? <laughs> yeah. I would like to say to any of my staff listening, please quickly turn on quickly a promo code called Tim Pool. No, no, uh, because uh, Daily Wire had a sponsor, uh, sponsored two of our shows this month. Oh, yeah. that's right. There, there is a promo code, code Tim Pool, 25% yeah. off. Heck yeah. And then do yeah. you get access to all the movies on the network and all the graphic novels when you subscribe? Yes. You, well, not the gra th there are no graphic novels yet in existence, but yes, you, you get The Ben Shapiro Show, Candace Owens Show, Michael Knowles, eh, if you want him, Matt yeah. Walsh, also uh, shut Andrew Clavin. Like you, you get the feature film Shut In, The Hyperions, right. Run, Hide, Fight. So truly like a Netflix, similar to a Netflix model at this state. Well, exactly. So, so, so we have a question here from But Uncle. instead of having every movie ever created, we have Run, Hide, Fight, Shut In, and The Hyperions. <laughs> 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 yeah. The Hyperions is out. The Hyperions is oh, out. I definitely it's, want to watch that. It's fabulous. Uh, Uncle D says, will The Daily Wire make cartoons? And a streaming service, mm. so we won't need Disney, Hulu, or Netflix. Well, we know you're doing a streaming service, but are you doing cartoons? Well, it was in, uh, it was reported today that Ben Shapiro said the Daily Wire is going to move into kids' content. Um, I, I had to call Ben and say, Ben, don't say things what? like that. Yeah. We're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. <laughs> uh, but it is, it is true that we are in development on kids' content, and it's definitely our hope uh, that in 2023 we can bring some great kids' content to the market. Spidge B says you need to jam with Jeremy. He's quite an accomplished musician. Yes. Ah, well, I'm not. I I am quite accomplished. What I'm not is very good. Oh. <laughs> uh, I say I'm accomplished because Smokey Mike and the God King played to a sold out house <laughs> at the <laughs> Mother Church of Country Music, That's the right, Ryman yeah. Auditorium. Wow. Good uh, stuff. I uh, but but you should never mistake that for talent, which I have. <laughs> I have very fleeting levels. Michael of talent. Knowles, he's he's really good. Michael's a great guitar player. Yeah, he? he sings. I too. cannot believe I'm hearing compliments of Michael Knowles Michael right now. Right? It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's disturbing. It's o only in the context of Smokey Mike and the God King yeah. will I say anything nice. Only his oh, alter ego group. gets a compliment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's his group. He's got to yeah, compliment no, himself. It's true. You know it's true. I mean? Tough break. All right. Andrew Lant says, God King, I've been a DW All Access member for as long as possible. Mm. Get with Seamus and give us our Freedom Tunes animated series already. Uh, I, when I sat down, uh, Seamus said, you know, what, what would you like to talk about at our meeting in, in two weeks? And I said, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know I, honest to God, didn't know we had a meeting yeah, 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 in two yeah. weeks. But, that was actually really, really uh, funny. But that is apparently a thing that's happening, and I couldn't, I'm stoked about it. Uh, I love Freedom Tunes. Thank you. Uh, ben Shapiro shooting lasers out of his eyes was a turning point. <laughs> Honestly, gang, okay, it's something I actually do every now and again. So the fact that he put it in a cartoon is really revolutionary. People need to know. Ben Shapiro <laughs> reacting, uh, shame, Freedom Tunes Ben Shapiro reacting to real Ben Shapiro reacting to Freedom Tunes was good. Uh, yeah, so Ben Shapiro reacted to my cartoon of him, and then I did a cartoon of cartoon Ben Shapiro <laughs> reacting to real Ben Shapiro <laughs> reacting to the cartoon. Or Ben Shapiro's Family Thanksgiving, was it? Honestly, that yes. was one yeah. of the best. Yeah, yeah. Family Thank Thanksgiving. You. Thank you. I love that one. He tweeted it. It's funny because right after I made it, I, t I uh, put it on Twitter, and then he retweeted it and said, this 
this is a documentary. <laughs> oh, <that's> great. <laughs> yeah. Did he really? Yeah, yeah. He said this oh, is a documentary. Wow. He, or he, I, I tweeted the link at him, and he posted the link and said, "This is a documentary." Fox. That's awesome. I, yeah. I have been to a family dinner or two at, at Ben's home with his entire family, and it is not unlike. <laughs> yeah. I knew it. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Chris Stark says, Tim and crew, you should read Milton Friedman, Unraveled by Murray Rothbard. Oh, yes, Rothbard. It helps to explain his role as to why we are in the current economic situation uh, and and some well worth it. Very smart man. Right oh, yeah. Now. Mind Fury says, The Metaverse. Remember Demolition Man from the mid-90s? Adult mm, activity so was banned and lovemaking required a VR headset. Oof. How prescient in retrospect. Mm. Ugh. Prescient Jeez. has never sounded more seedy than the way you just yeah, yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel I good see. about it. I know. All right. Roberto Lara says, Lex had the same discussion with Mark Zuckerberg about how we'll represent ourselves on the metaverse. A recommendable podcast. You get to see the Android Mark versus the robot Lex. That is interesting. Mm. Yeah. PHG, uh, PH Gamer says, OMG, at Tim, you need to watch Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. It was eerie where it went. But there was an episode where a stalker put on a cyber suit body of her lover and tried to kill him. I have seen Ghost in the Shell standalone complexes, but it's been, I think, 20 years or, you know, close to that. So I should rewatch it. But amazing series. I love that opening song by Origa as well. Good music. All right. Matt R says, if you like sharp things in a business that doesn't hate anyone, try my brother's mall shop, animearmory.square.site. They have, huh. they have a sharp Zelda prop for you. Ooh. We have the. You saw the master sword. I saw the master sword. I want to. I want to sharpen it. <laughs> well, yeah, you've got to sharpen it. But I don't think it's made of a real. It's I don't know material. how you're going to kill Ganon with a dull master yeah. sword. Silver arrows. It's magic, I suppose. Yeah. Eric Kanzen says, "Ian, quote, I'm a huge Star Trek TNG fan. Doesn't know what best of both worlds is. Shaking my head. Well, true. Tr- I want to. I just want to. In defense of Ian, it's been so long since I've actually done a watch through of TNG. It's been, I think, like seven years." That I probably am gonna, you know, I watched, I, I mess up names. I went well. through like a, a year phase where I watched every episode night after night, or like a five or six month thing, but I didn't catch the names of any of them. Mm-hmm. Ray, I'm, I'm old and watched them in real time. Nice. Oh, I, I mean, I watched them when I was a little kid. My dad would put I it on. I'd sit on the couch and you saw them all in real time. Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Yeah, I, I very vividly remember I was on a uh, a band trip. I was a saxophone player and I was in in the high school band and we were down in Austin, Texas in an embassy suites and everybody's going to go out and hang out for the night. But it was the night of the, of the final series finale of the next generation. Uh, and so I stayed inside and watched Picard and Q mix it up and everybody else went out. And- yeah. He was a great character, man. Yeah. All right. BN like says, it. I've heard Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry was a confirmed atheist who hated organized religion. The acronym Borg stands for Bigoted Organized Religious Groups. Any thoughts? Sad. I don't believe I don't believe the Borg thing. But he wasn't Roddenberry was an atheist. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um in the original series but bigoted they're, is a modern... they're less heavy hand- handed about it, but then in, in Next Gen Picard says some things which are like more overtly secular. Yeah. But uh uh bigoted wasn't used as frequently in that context back then yeah. as it is today. So I'm not sure that I believe that. You know. Mm. All right. What is it? Uh, mixed up says Jeremy asked him to sing a song on the members only segment. <laughs> Truth be told, I thought it was going to say something about Jeremy singing because you have a hit song, I think, right? Uh, uh, do, uh, together again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sing us the song. You're the beanie man. Yeah. What? There you go. That's right. <laughs> All right. We'll grab a couple more here. Actually, uh, Tigre says when Dallas Sonnier was on, is that, is that, am, I, am I pronouncing that right? Sonnier. Sonnier, Sonnier yeah, yeah. was on Timcast IRL. He said Daily Wire needs to break into the sci fi genre. Jeremy, would you prefer to read a treatment sooner or a screen pe- screenplay later? I have studied up on your stuff and have something I think uh, fits the Daily Wire. Yeah, one of the real challenges is how to take submissions. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you talk mm, about tough. how uh, we make a lot of money and there are all these rules about how we can spend it. Uh, the rules around copyright and pitches, unsolicited in particular pitches, are so absurd if you send a screenplay to me, I will not be able to read it legally. Mm. If you mail it to me, I will not be able to open the mail. If you email it to me, I will have to delete it without opening it and show my attorney that I've deleted it because uh, the studios for years and years and years have paid settlement money to people who say, uh, you know, Jurassic Park, that was my, I had the idea that we should make a movie with dinosaurs in it 24 years ago. And I pitched it to a guy who at that time worked in the concession stand at an AMC theater or whatever. Uh, and, and that's a very lucrative business. And so I'll just tell you that for me, uh, one of the great stories of my life, this guy, Roderick Taylor, the Falconer, who's had a bunch of uh, songs. He had seven records with David Geffen, 
back in the 70s and 80s. And then he became a great screenwriter. He, he wrote on TV. Then he had a feature film with Jodie Foster called The Brave One that you may recall. And Rod told me this great story one time where his father was at a retirement community or something down in Florida and called him. Hey, Dad, how's it going? Rod, I, I need to put you on the phone with my friend. Uh, you don't have any friends, Dad. What are you talking about? No, no, my, my friend, my friend who works at the front desk of the old folks home. He's like, all right, Dad, put him on the phone. Guy gets on the phone and goes, hey, I've got this great idea for a screenplay. And Rod said, I don't need your idea. I'm a professional writer. It's basically he was he was in Glengarry Glen Ross. Uh, I don't. I'm a professional writer. I have had every idea. Ideas are not what's missing. What's missing is execution. And this is a great lesson. Your screenplay may be terrific. Your idea may be great. It is all execution at every step. And uh, I wish that I could short shortcut for you how to get your screenplay to me, especially if it's well executed. But you just have to keep executing, and we have to find ways around these really prohibitive laws that make it almost impossible because if I hear your idea and it's bad, it still puts me in a position where I can't make a good version of that idea or some other idea that's sort of tangentially related to that idea 20 years from now when I don't even remember the bad idea that I've heard. Can they? So this can be fixed. There are ways around it, but it is very challenging. Can they recuse on the mail? I, oh, I, subject, I want no copyright for this. Yes, and in fact, one of the things that we are talking about doing is trying to create some sort of digital submission because in a digital submission, I can make you check the box before you right. submit. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is not because I want to steal people's ideas. Not in any way. It's because we, Dallas Sonier has read 500 scripts for me in the last year. 500 scripts. Every idea, in some, some germ of every idea has been present in one of those scripts. So you just can't be in a situation where 20 years from now you make something. You can't, there's no way you stole someone's idea, right? You're just, you're doing the work. You can't create those liabilities. That, Again, there are ways around it. That's one way. I, I, I've, I've never uh, cared much for idea. I, I, I've never viewed ideas as being the most important thing. Like you're saying, mm -hmm. execution is everything. Yes. And I actually think it's kind of a cop out too for people who are like, I had this idea and it's like, and you did nothing with it. You didn't. Yeah, so exactly. So I've been at a bunch of meetings and uh, I learned this when I was in California from a lot of people, or this is what, what, what they told me is uh, what you're told when you're growing up poor is never share your ideas because they'll steal it. Yep. And what they tell you when you're rich is share your idea with everyone you can to refine it. Because mm -hmm. if, if an investor hears it, they're going to hire you, the guy who thought of it, who has the vision and the passion to do it, to, 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 to make it. Because well, trying to find someone else to do it means you're going to have someone who's not driven to do it. It's a mistake. Yeah. So for me, for the most part, I don't care if someone steals my ideas. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my ideas, whatever, with anybody. And I'm, I'll, I'm such a firm believer in execution that I'll give away any idea too. My, my friend, not, no one's going to steal it. <laughs> yeah, and that's right. Most people, even if they knew exactly how to do what you've done, if even if you gave them, a, even if it were replicable and you gave them the, the blueprint on how to replicate it, 99.9% .9 of people wouldn't. Exactly. And even so, if you're so, paying them sometimes, like there's a, I'm blessed not, with an amazing team, but sometimes like you could be working on a project with a group of people, or if, if any of you have worked a job with, with other people who just were not doing what they were supposed to, it's like, you can get orders from people above you to do a specific thing. And like, everyone drops the ball. So the idea that people are just going to like take your idea and, and make it for free is ridiculous. Well, you know, so I've been in so many meetings, pitching ideas and everything. And I've always just been like, here's all of my ideas. Mm -hmm. None of them have ever been stolen. Yeah. The, the, the issue you'll learn when it comes to a lot of investors too, because I've sat down with big investor meetings and they're like, you know, we've had conversations about how people are scared of their ideas being stolen. And they were like, the, the idea that we'd invest in a random person we'd hire as opposed to the person who had the idea is kind of a crazy thought. It, it can happen if a really dumb person, like a really undriven person who doesn't do anything, puts two and two together and like, that is actually a good idea, but this person can't pull it off. I'll tell you an amazing story. When we met with uh, the high net worth individual who gave us the the initial capital on which we built the Daily Wire, uh, again, it was a very small amount of money compared to the success that we've driven, but we needed it. It was an instrumental moment in our, money to, in our uh, careers to go raise that money. We're sitting in this giant like Bond villain uh, conference room. You know, I'm sure there was a shark button that they could have pressed if they didn't like our pitch. And the high net worth individual was in the room and some and some other members of his family were in the room. And Ben and I were, and Caleb were giving our pitch. And at a certain point, one of one of the high net worth individual's relatives leaned back in his chair and he said, you know, people pitch us ideas all the time. And a lot of people have come in here and say they want to build a company that makes conservative content, puts it on the internet. Why should we give our money to you? 
and Ben Shapiro did not miss not not half a second. He said, <laughs> I'm better than they are. <laughs> there you go. Execution. That's it. Um, if you go before me and you say, I, I tell this people all the time, mm -hmm. when it comes to sales and pitches, you might get a, 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 someone with no talent, but someone who speaks well, like the, no, no ability to build the machine, but they can tell you they can build the machine. And who am mm -hmm. I supposed to trust? If someone comes to me and says, I want to build a 3D printer, I'm going to say, why should, I, you, why should I fund this? And if they say, well, look, to be honest, there are a lot of printers out there. You know, I think I can do a good job, but um, I, I, will, I will do my best. I'm like, okay. If some guy comes in and says, listen, you want a 3D printer? I'm going to build it. It'll be the best you've ever seen. No one can do it better than me. I'll be like, all right, well, if you don't have the confidence yourself to do it, I can't invest in it. Yeah. With that being said, go to TimCast.com. Have confidence in us. Because yes. we're going to have a members only segment coming up around 11 p.m. is when we'll publish it. So smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, and become a member at TimCast.com. You can follow us at TimCast IRL basically everywhere. You can follow me at TimCast. Jeremy, did you want to shout anything out? Well, first of all, uh, I would promote TimCast, but everybody listening already knows about it. Uh, but I really appreciate you guys having me on the show. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to head over to IHateHarrys.com, they'll get the shave of their life uh, with a Jeremy's razor. And we'd love to have your business over at DailyWire.com as well. Right on. I'm Seamus Coglin. I create an animated web series called Freedom Tunes. If y'all want to go check that out, we released a cartoon today and Ooh. one on Tuesday. Go over there and subscribe, please. And thank you very much. Ian Crossland from iancrossland.net. Seamus, can you roll me that red 100 You want me to guy? roll you this dice? Yeah. You're going to risk it? No, no, I'm not going to. I just, I don't want you to like roll a one and the show on a little gift, note, buddy. I have a gift for you. It's this red 100 sided <laughs> oh, <guy. yeah. laughs> oh, my God. Here <laughs> oh, my God. Happy birthday to me. That was a 20, my Happy friend. Happy birthday, That's homie. Yeah. You're Look a wonderful human being. Right there. Love you, Seamus. Thank you. Oh, Jeremy, thank you. So much hey, for coming, man. Hey, Love Seamus. You. Yeah. Ian gave me 120 sided dice. Yeah. Well, it's different. Comparison. Sure, it really is the thief of fun. joy. Yes, I know, right? It's <laughs> <laughs> terrible. Anyway, I really appreciate that that high note to go out on. Thank you so much for coming, Jeremy. I really appreciate what you guys are doing over at the Daily Wire. We are having John Madley, Ma bleh, John Mattingly on mm, in the future, you. and Andrew Clavin as well. We're very excited to do like this crossover between the two different companies. I am Sarah Petchlitz. You can follow me on Twitter and Minds.com. We will see all of you over at TimCast.com. Thanks for hanging out. Bye, guys.